The uh, regular meeting of the Board of Curators is back in session, and it is, uh, it is a real pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Moon Choi, President of our University, to give his first Missouri Systems President's Report. Dr. Choi. Thank you, Chairman Graham. So before I begin with my remarks, I want to take this opportunity to share my personal appreciation for the transitions that are occurring. As you know, Michael Middleton has uh, resumed his retirement after a 51-year partnership with the university. And that's really incredible. I don't see him in the audience with us today at this moment, but there will be a formal recognition of his uh, many years of service, and most recently, as the interim president. Cheryl Schrader, as many of you know, is moving on to become the president of Wright State University. We wish you the very best in Dayton, Ohio. And Hank Foley will assume the position of the New York president of New York Institute of Technology in New York City. So Hank, Cheryl, Many thanks to all of your contributions and great success. Don't forget, you're always a miner and you're always a tiger, Hank. All right. Now, with these departures, we're also welcoming many outstanding leaders to the university. First, let me ask Dr. Chris Maples to stand. Chris, he is the incoming interim chancellor designate he was a previously he was previously president of oregon institute of technology a faculty member and chair at indiana university in geosciences served for many years as a program manager at nsf and he's very excited to be coming to rala we're also very excited and so chris thank you very much thank you Next up is uh, Dr. Kristen Sobolik. Kristen, she is the incoming, incoming provost at UMSO, and she begins her job on Monday. But she's been on the job for many months already, working with Tom George, and she's part of the I-70 exchange that we have with Wright State. She is uh, currently, or as of a few weeks ago, Dean of Arts and Sciences at Wright State University. So, Kristen, welcome. We have a lot of exciting things to do together with all of the members of the Board of Curators, so thank you. So when I began my job, my new position about eight weeks ago, I was so excited. I was so excited about the possibilities. But I must admit, after spending eight weeks on the job, I'm even more excited because of the opportunities, as well as the challenges. Because we all believe, as members of the University of Missouri System, Board of Curators, that we have a very important calling to support public higher education and its mission and its goals. To achieve that, though, we must be very focused on excellence, very focused on having the urgency to make the changes, and also, this is a time to be very bold. With three new curators and four continuing curators and two additional curators that will be joining, who will be joining us in a few weeks, we are really poised to look at every aspect of our university and ask, how do we improve this university for the benefit of the students, faculty, staff, as well as our partners in the state, whether it's partners in extension, industry partners, or citizens in Missouri. But in order for us to develop that plan to move forward, I believe that it's very important for all of us to understand where we are. And we have to be honest with ourselves about where we are. Because if you want to reach that next level, that next level may be to become a top 25 public research university, or a top 25 public urban university, or a top 10 technological university. But in that regard, we must address 
the situation that we currently have to say, where are we? And what are the investments that are needed for us to get there? So let me start off by sharing with you some statistics. And the curators and general officers have that in front of you. And this is the most recent survey from Arizona State University measuring university progress. And it measures all of the campuses based on metrics that are important for top public research universities. Total research at MU in 2013 was $233 million. In some of the categories, when you don't see a number, it's because it didn't register among the top 200 universities. So you can get a sense looking at this, where are we competitive? Where are we not competitive? Where are, where are opportunities for us as a university system to move the university forward? Next, because Mizzou is the uh, university that has the most categories, I want to focus on Mizzou. But similar, similar analysis can be done for the other universities as well. But let me focus on Mizzou. In 2003, Mizzou's total research was $205 million. That ranked 46th among public universities. By comparison, Minnesota was at $509 million, number seven. And University of Illinois Chicago, which is an urban institution, but with the largest medical school in the United States, registered $291 million. What's also important for AAU metrics is federal research, right here. And as you can see, these are the comparisons. What's also important is the number of doctorates that are awarded. Parentheses are those for public university rankings. It's also interesting to note that back in 2003, the endowment for Mizzou was at 571, and the annual giving was about $71 million per year. But compare that to the other universities, especially for Minnesota. $1.7 billion endowment, $250 million in annual giving that supports ongoing programs as well as endowments. Now let's flip to 2013. Remember, we're $84 million, Minnesota's $293, UIC's $168. Look at the jump that we saw in Minnesota and UIC, and the fact that Mizzou increased by about 20% during that period. I wasn't here back in 2003 or 2013, but by looking at some of the numbers, I believe that the lack of faculty members, as well as lack of appropriate research space, contributed to this effort. And as we look at the endowment, endowment for Minnesota grew from 1.7 billion to 3.2 billion. And look at the annual giving. Part of that is the excitement that research creates. If Minnesota is developing the next generation bio joints that help save people's lives, then those are the types of projects and initiatives that get the public, alums, and corporations very excited. So another area that we need to focus on is industry partnerships, not only with industries in the state, but throughout the United States. And as I shared with you before, this is the trend just over the past five years. Look at the number of faculty members at Mizzou, 1,080, and this past year, 983. When you see red, it means that compared to 2012, faculty numbers went down. The only school that, in which faculty members went up was ST. But with a declining number of faculty who are on the tenure tenure track, we're going to have less researchers. Now, it'll be very interesting to find out where the departures occurred, whether they were retirements or faculty members who were research active who are essentially poached by other universities. We need to do that analysis to figure out how do we stem the tide. But we're not gonna be able to grow the research without growing the number of faculty members. And when we look at space deficits, 
At MU, just on the academic spaces, there's about 242,000 square feet of space deficits. At SNT, it's about 90,000 square feet. And they are the most research active universities as part of our system. UMKC, there's a slight surplus. And as we heard yesterday, there is a surplus at UMSO. And these are the programs that have the greatest space deficits in these universities. And as Mark McIntosh will share a little bit later, at Mizzou, the last research building that was built was the Bond Sciences Building, and that was in 2004, 13 years ago. Another measure that's very important as we try to determine how do we move up to become a more recognized university, U.S. News and World Report is a good measure. Some may think that it's a popularity contest, but it's more than that. There is a popularity component, but as you can see in each of these categories, all of these weights add up to 100%. So for example, acceptance rate is worth 1.25% of the total score. And here you see the overall rank among publics and privates. Michigan is at 27th, and it's probably the second highest public university after Berkeley. Illinois is 44, Wisconsin's 44, Rutgers is at 70, and I put Rutgers there because that's a university that's ranked number 25 among publics. So if we want to become a top 25 university at Mizzou, or a top 10 science and technology university, or a top 50 public urban university, we have to measure ourselves against our aspirants. What I want to show here is in all of these categories, we have some work to do. Mizzou's ranked 111. UMSO is ranked 220th. And I challenged faculty members when I share this at the Faculty Senate. And I challenged the faculty at UMSO, do you believe that your school is ranked 220th in the country? Answer was emphatically no. We have some of the top programs in criminology, wonderful programs in international business, growing program in engineering, WashU. But unless we share our stories to talk about all of these great things that are happening, we're not going to be able to move the needle. But we also have to do a better job of recruiting students and being more selective, as you can see from here. <coughs> Next up, even categories like percent of classes that have more than 50 students, percent of classes with less than 20 students, percent of freshmen and top 10% of high school graduating class, retention rate, graduation rate, and the graduation performance rate. As you can see, acceptance rate was at 1.25%, but six-year graduation rate is worth 18%. And if we look at six-year graduation rate, Rutgers is at 80%. So we have some work to do. But all of these contribute right here in terms of smaller, more intimate classes where students get the attention, contribute to the overall retention and graduation rates. This is the last slide on U.S. News and World Report. And this is where you may think that popularity comes in which is high school counselor score, 7.5%, and peer assessment score at 15%. And once again, I challenge the faculty, do you believe that we are ranked just above a C or below a C as a university based on our peer evaluation? Answer again is no. But if they don't know about the wonderful things that are happening at RALA, for example, to have 100% experiential learning, 100% satisfaction rate by employers who hire the graduates of SNT, then they're not going to know what to evaluate that university's uh, performance. And so we have to get our message out there. Another thing that is very important, and this is a serious issue, both faculty compensation rank and financial resources rank. Financial resources rank is composed of investments made by the university and the state towards education, divided by the total number of students that are 
part of that university. And as you can see in financial resources rank, we are not doing very well. When it comes to faculty salaries, faculty compensation, once again, we are not doing well. And that's because during the past five years, we had very few raises. Now, raises are provided on a merit basis. There's no across the board raises. But it is very important for us to recognize and reward outstanding faculty members who are contributing. And that's going to be a key to retain those faculty as well as recruiting those faculty members to the university. This is a slide that I think um, many of you will be very interested in seeing, which is by universities, percent of Pell recipients among the undergraduate population, percent underrepresented among undergraduate students, the net price paid by students who come from families with incomes less than $30,000, Pell graduation rate, Pell recipient graduation rate over six years, and non-Pell graduation rates over six years. And it's interesting to see University of Michigan, University of Illinois, and Indiana University all do much better than all of the other universities that we have. And you can also see a very big spread in some of these cases. And I've said this before, Pell Grant recipients are, are the students that we need to provide as much support, tutoring support, financial support, so that they are able to become productive citizens. If only one in, one in three Pell recipients graduate over a six year period, they spent all that time at a university, paid the tuition, and did not receive a degree. That's devastating for the student. It's devastating for the university. When we look at Michigan, Michigan's Pell graduation rate is higher than all of our campuses. So we have some work to do, but it's not going to be magic. We have to figure out why are our students not graduating. We have to have effective advising. We have to have intervention early on. And these are some of the programs that we will work with throughout the university system to make uh, a greater contribution. Another thing that's very important is Indiana University for Pell Grant recipients, the net price is 4,632. So they're able to use university resources and maybe students who are out of state or students who can afford to pay the higher tuition and those funds are then directed to those students who are qualified to study at the university but have the greatest financial need. These are metrics that we need to measure and improve. So going forward, we're going to be working very closely with all of the chancellors, provosts, CFOs, and the board of curators to make the investments that are needed for us to become a more research active university as well as a more uh, student-centric university that measures effective student outcomes. So some of these uh, items that I share here are not new to our faculty. We need to have cluster hiring in innovative areas. We need to have new laboratories that are modern to be able to attract faculty members as well as retain faculty members. We also need to have shared equipment. Instead of having equipment that belongs to one faculty member, bring it into a shared facility that enables collaboration. And last but not least, support for proposal writing for interdisciplinary, multi-university, multi-investigator proposals, which is the trend at NIH, NSF, and DOD. And when it comes to student success, our focus should be on increasing need-based aid and student scholarship for merit aid. We also need to increase the graduation rates, as I've shared before. But as I've walked around the campuses, all four campuses, I run into students who are just outstanding students. And I always ask them the question, are you planning to go to graduate schools? In many cases, they say yes. But we should also encourage and support their applications for fellowships that enable them to pursue graduate studies. 
like the NSF Graduate Fellowship, Truman Scholarship, and why not? Let's get a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Missouri. It's about time. Also, we need to have a greater focus on seamless online education across all of the campuses. And I'll be working with Bob Schwartz, Gary Allen, and all of the campuses to make it easy for students, regardless of where they reside, to be able to take advantage of courses that are available across all four campuses. Last but not least, we just uh, discussed as an informational item tuition increase of 2.1%. And for in-state students, that's about $200, Ryan, would you say? About $200. But if we were also able to share with the students, we care about affordability. We want to see how we can use open source textbooks to be able to meet your needs. And so my, uh, my good friend, Elizabeth Smith, helped us order some of these books. These are all books that are available open source from OpenStax, and this is a real book. This was developed by a faculty member at UConn. It's available for free to download anywhere, multiple downloads. You can have this printed by Barnes & Noble for about $50. I went downstairs, and it's a thinner book, by the way. This is what's being sold downstairs from Pearson. Chemistry. Hank, you're a chemist. And I would like for you to evaluate the quality of the books. But this was $315. And so if we can have courses like calculus, US history, psychology that is available using open source textbooks throughout the entire university system, as well as dual enrollment students, imagine the cost savings. Typical cost of textbooks for undergraduate students is $1,200. We're paying to increase tuition by $200. So the savings to the students is incredible. And faculty members do not even have to write their own book. It's available. It's on openstacks.org. And so these are some of the programs that we need to provide incentives and encouragement to say, this is how we're going to be meeting the needs of students. Affordability is very important. Access is very important. And excellence is very important. So let me end the presentation with, can you go to the next slide? With uh, a very important aspect of our university. We're a land grant University of Mizzou. We have two urban institutions that are public research. We have a wonderful Science and Technology University. There's so much that we can offer to this state. But I do believe, coming as, as an outsider, so you have to give me a little leeway on this, I don't believe that the University of Missouri system has effectively shared the benefits to the state and the nation. These universities have used a firm called Trip Umbach based on the research, teaching, and the contributions from Extension and all of the service learning, for these universities, they've estimated that on an annual basis, their contributions to the impact, economic impact, ranges from 8.6 to 13.9 billion. Illinois used to receive about a billion dollars a year in state investment. It's probably reduced quite a bit. But for every dollar that's invested in Illinois, the return is $13.9. We're going to be launching a similar study using Trip Bombach to demonstrate to the citizens of the state and to all of us what our economic impact is through our research, teaching, and outreach. And the estimate is going to be somewhere between three to four billion dollars, we believe, but we want to be able to compare apples to apples to see how we're compared to other top universities. Next slide. So let me um, end with this slide, which is a slide that I've shared with all of the faculty senate, and I'm coming back to Rala next week to share the same thing. But it's really focusing on excellence, creating an investment model for research, student outcomes, and diversity and creating pipeline programs to support diversity.
But as we move forward, we know that we've, we're facing a very difficult financial situation in the state and the university. But as we all know, we can't cut our way to excellence. So we're going to do the hard work of identifying those programs that we can no longer afford to support, but at the same time, we have to grow the revenue to make investments into programs that will take us to that next level. So I want to thank you for your support. I look forward to working with all of the Board of Curators as well as administrators and faculty members at all of the campuses. And let me just end by saying it is an exciting time for the University of Missouri system, and I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Choi. That was a tremendous presentation, and I know that I can speak for the board that uh, we are uh, we're, we're with you in this effort. And thank you so much. Next is uh, on the agenda is the uh, a new portion uh, of our general business meeting that we've uh, started holding this year, and that is the critical issues portion of our meeting. This is a time when we as curators and as general officers uh, look at some of the issues that we are facing. Uh, and those this morning we're going to talk about were identified by Dr. Choi uh, in his presentation. But I've asked Dr. Bob Swartz to take the lead here with uh, people he's going to introduce. And we're going to turn it over to Dr. Swartz, but then this is an interactive, this is an interactive uh, uh, portion of our meeting, and I know the curators will do as we did at our earlier meeting. We'll uh, uh, be asking questions, but I'll also encourage the general officers who are, who are here to feel free to speak up. This is a time when we want to think outside of the box. We want to address the issues that Dr. Choi has identified and find ways to to solve some of the problems he's identified and to help move this university system forward. Bob? Okay, thank you very much, Marcy. And good morning, everyone. First, let me ask maybe the most important question. Curators, can you still see the slides if our uh, chief research officers are sitting up here? Okay, good, just wanted to make sure of that. So we're very glad to be with you today and we wish you good morning. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what we'd like to try to cover for you today. And there will be six presentations, and I know uh, Curator Graham really does want to keep this interactive, and I'll echo that. Interrupt any of us at any time if you have a question. But we did want to try to get some things on the table for you this morning. And once the talks are done, we should have hopefully about another hour, excuse me, another half hour uh, for the presentations. So this is the way uh, I've structured my uh, part of the program this morning. First, I'd just like to talk very briefly about the picture at the local, national, and global levels when it comes to research and development. And there's some really interesting things going on at all of those levels, and we really won't be able to explore each of those this morning, but I think it's good to, to think about context always of how we fit in uh, to the, uh, the rest of the U.S. and the rest of the world. I'll briefly talk a little bit about uh, public research universities, talk a little bit about how we might strategically advance uh, in our research mission. We heard a little bit about that from President Choi already, and then I'll just do some very brief uh, stage settings. So for any of the CROs up front, if you want to pivot your chairs back a little bit so you can see the slides, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Okay, so let me, let me just kind of start with a very quick uh, definition of uh, research uh, and development and talk again about context. What we're really talking about is the uh, concept of taking an idea and getting that into some type of product. Typically we look at three stages for this, whether it's basic, uh, which is the initial phase of the research, and I'll give an example of that in just a second, then going to applied research and eventually going to uh, what's referred to as development. And globally, if you look at what we invest in this, we invest about, uh, as a country, about $514 billion a year. 
which for us is about 2.8% of our GDP. Our GDP is uh, a bit over uh, uh, $80 million. And that's 2016 data. Where do universities fit in? We typically fit in on the basic end of this spectrum. And if you look at dividing that 514 billion, we're gonna focus mostly on the basic part, and we'll do in the United States about 56% of the basic research carried out in the United States. And you can see the investments here, they range from industry still putting in the most money, a little bit over 330 billion, down to academia, and we invest about $18.3 billion of our own dollars into this. And maybe the best example of looking at uh, basic to full product development, uh, and I know Hank has used this example, and I was familiar with this example of, as a student, is the example of the transistor. It was discovered in 1956, and if you actually see a picture of that, it looks like a chunk of junk sitting on top of a table with a few wires attached to it, okay? But what a transistor is, it's an electronic switch. Basically, it's my, like me hitting a button, except doing that electronically. I can control the flow of electrons across a junction. Believe it or not, that discovery won a Nobel Prize. And if you think about where we are today, thinking about an early transistor, then going to the integrated circuit, and now 61 years later, believe it or not, you have a supercomputer on your hip. You really do. And we think about these maybe, I know we still call them phones, these are really supercomputers. This device that I hold in my hand, which is an iPhone 6S, I didn't mean to put a plug in for Apple this morning. This has 120 million times the computing power of the computer that went to the moon back in 1969. Let me, let me say that again, 120 million times the computing power. So it's amazing, if you look at this, this short little two arrow diagram, basic to development, the transistor to a device that you utilize every day, probably for just about everything. Facebook, right? We take advantage of the internet. That's the types of advances we're talking about. And the changes on the effect of life or the quality of life as we look at the innovations we're able to develop. So just one last thing, and this is maybe hopefully a little thought provoking. This is a recent headline in USA Today. And there's no question mark at the end of this. This is a, a, a concise statement why China is beating the U.S. at innovation. And they're pumping now in, they've gone from 12 billion in 1995 to nearly 300 billion in 2015 in terms of late stage research. It's really a paradigm shift and I think we need to be very, very thoughtful of that. And I might just leave you with um, a, a thought provoking comment or two. And one of those would be, if we lose at innovation, do we lose? And I'll yet let you decide what that really means, that question. If we lose at innovation, do we really lose? And the other one would be, are we putting the right amount of money into research, and how do you determine that? So let me talk just a little bit about where we are, where we fit in. Often, uh, a system called the Carnegie Classification System is used to understand uh, <coughs> research institutions. So we have three higher research activity institutions, UMKC, Missouri S&T, and UMSL, and we have one highest research activity institution, which is MU. Our total expenditures, grants and contracts are about $305 million in FY17, that's estimated. And if you look and move a little bit from the top part of the slide, which is really the research part of the slide, to the economic development portion of the slide, we did about $16.4 million a year in licensing income. And recently we were uh, ranked for uh, some of our efforts and success in that area. And I would note that most of the money that we pump into this part of the operation, the economic development operation, we self-generate. It comes in through this licensing income. So we're achieving this through money we're generating through our innovations that are, be, are being picked up through spin-off businesses uh, as well as other businesses. So another thing I wanted to just talk briefly about is what it means to be a public <coughs> research university. And we have four of those. And you can look at that from a variety of perspectives. One of them is from a headline perspective. Okay, and these are three headlines just out of one week off of one campus. This type of stuff, as you heard Dick Brow talk about this morning, this goes on every day 
at the university. And I think, I'm sure you could sense his passion for that. I hope you'll see that uh, again this morning in our talks. But we're working across the spectrum in terms of the different types of research we're carrying out. The top one, and I can't even pronounce this, Kisekia. Mark, how close am I? You're a med guy. Kakexia. Okay. A little louder? Kakexia. Kakexia. That's responsible for about one-third of cancer deaths. It's also known as a wasting disease, which affects pans cancer patients. So we focus on a variety of things, both at the very basic end, drug delivery, through working with corporations. Um, how many of you here are a product of a public research university. You went to MU, you went to Missouri S&T, okay? I am too, okay? We have a great mission, okay, which is really to serve the public good, and that's why many of us are here. One of the things we take great pride in is unique opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to measure those, sometimes it's not as difficult to measure those, but Chancellor Schrader yesterday talked about experiential learning. Okay, and one of those is undergraduate research, and we really focus on that, and that's one of the types of opportunities our students can get. And I had a young man who was here that I've known for 32 years, so, okay, maybe he's not quite so young anymore. But uh, back in 1985, I was a PhD student at the University of Illinois, and there was an undergraduate researcher who actually wound up working with me on my dissertation project. And that young man has now gone on to become a faculty member here at Missouri S&T, Bill Fahrenholtz, and he's actually a curator's distinguished professor at Missouri S&T. I knew him as an undergrad, you know. Man, never get people mad at you. You never know how long you're going to work with them. But it's amazing what someone I knew as an undergraduate student went on to become in his career. And I've just put a summary of his accomplishments up here for you to think about. For his publications, he's got 138 peer-reviewed papers. He has more than 8,000 citations to his research. He's got one paper with 1,000 citations. One paper. 1,000 people looked at that. Various book chapters, various patents, more than $7 million in SC, a shared credit. That's specifically what he was responsible for in his grants. He's taught thermo, phase equilibrium, 63 different courses since coming to Missouri S&T. So this isn't someone who's just in the lab. This is someone who is actually inter interacting with our students on a very regular basis, on a daily basis. Bill's now serving as editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Ceramic Society, which in my discipline is the top journal. He's done things like the Youth Science, the Worldwide Youth Science Excellence Academic Challenge. He's been the coordinator of the Freshman Faculty Forum here, which is a program which tries to uh, educate young faculty about how they're best going to succeed in their academic careers. Just a remarkable guy. He's done a lot of things. He's the product of public higher education. And if you look at, and we always try and we always should try to convey the value that we offer. But how do you measure that when these are contributions that have occurred over the last 18 years, 15, 20 years after he graduated? It's difficult to think about that. Um, let me keep going. I know I'm going to be running out of time. So I've tried to package how we might think about advancing strategically. So on this slide, what you'll see are the different opportunities. And Dick did a nice job of laying these out this, this morning. They always start with federal competitive grants. We think about where we might uh, invest. Dr. Choi talked about this this morning with cluster hires. What are some of the other strategy and tactics we might use? Are we going to seed grant or try to give seed funding to our faculty so they can go out and develop proposals? And what's the context against which we do this? What's the environment in which we're trying to advance in research, likely an environment of level funding and always uh, more competition? So let me introduce our presenters, and I'm going to bring Mark up so we can try to stay on time. But I've asked each of them to talk about a very different topic. We're not up here today to tell you how we're going to advance in research. That's what we want to dialogue with you about. So I've talked to them, and I've asked them to speak about just kind of a spectrum of some of the different things that are occurring at our institutions. 
And Mark's going to talk uh, about infrastructure, both strengths and needs. And you can come on up. It's OK. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, we talked yesterday, and Dr. Choi talked about space. The only way we're going to get faculty like Bill Fahrenholtz is to have great facilities for them to work in. Okay, it lets us get them. It lets us get the great students. Then I've la asked Lawrence to talk about innovation to commercialization, Wes to talk about a little bit different topic, non-STEM research. Marisa will talk about the role of corporate research, and Tony will finish up with uh, some of the work he's doing on a uh, proposal in the uh, health area. Mark, thank you. Well, uh, thank you to the board and President Choi for this opportunity to be here this morning. So um, I'm going to, as, um, as Bob said, I'm going to talk a little bit about research infrastructure. I'm going to use MU uh, as an example. Uh, and what I'll end up doing is illustrating for you uh, some of the very specific things, uh, some specific opportunities that we have uh, to meet some of the challenges that Dr. Choi uh, presented this morning. So. <clears throat> Uh, here, are, here are a series of opportunities that we have in front of us on the uh, Mizzou campus, uh, and, uh, uh, and, but also some very significant threats. So as you can see, um, we are changing leadership in many of our uh, research active colleges. Uh, we have new deans already in place in medicine, engineering. Uh, we'll soon have a new dean in uh, agriculture. We have new deans in business, law, extension, and we're about to launch the, new, the search for the new dean of arts and sciences. So this gives us a significant opportunity to change the leadership in our research uh, intensive colleges and, and begin to change the culture to a more research active environment. Um, strategic faculty recruitment in cross-disciplinary areas is going to be the objective of these leaders. Uh, One Health, biomedical innovation, big data analytics, plant sciences, and on and on. There are several areas where we have significant research strength. Um, as Dr. Choi mentioned to you, we have to change our AAU research metrics. We have to move out of the bottom three of the public institutions in the AAU to a significantly higher level. And the only way that we're going to do that is to do these kinds of investments and some of the infrastructure investments that I'm going to talk about. Um, we have to invest in cutting edge technologies. I'll give you a few illustrations here in just a moment of cutting edge technologies that we've begun to invest in on the MU campus using resources that we're getting from the intellectual property uh, of our faculty. Here are the threats that we have. And the number one threat that we have on the MU campus, and I'm sure it's true of the other campuses as well, is high quality research laboratory space, as Dr. Choi mentioned. We have a se severe space deficit in some really key areas that we have to overcome. I'll illustrate one or two ways in which we might uh, can think about overcoming that uh, deficit. Faculty recruitment and retention. If we don't give them high quality research space, we're not going to get them here in the first place. The Life Sciences Center, which was built in 2004 as our last major investment in research space, made a huge difference in our ability to recruit faculty to the University of Missouri. Um, and now that that building's 13 years old, uh, um, it would be um, 2020 before we could get another significant research building actually built. Um, the space around campus has deteriorated to the point that some of our best faculty are being recruited away from us. Right now, we have few collaborations among the campuses, uh, but there are unique opportunities coming up. Tony's going to tell us about one here at the end of the day, uh, where engineering and medicine and other areas are great opportunities for us to begin to interact. Marissa's putting together an uh, engineering resource center, so um, uh, hopefully that'll give us another set of possible interactions. All right, so I'm going to use three examples here uh, to illustrate some of the, uh, the infrastructure opportunities before I do that. And there are plenty of, um, of ideas going on, but I'm going to talk specifically about translational precision medicine, a cyclotron, and expansion of innovation. So this is in the areas of basic research, economic development, and uh, revenue generation uh, through our scientific efforts. Before I do that, I just want to illustrate very briefly We've invested about $12 million over the last couple of years in getting high-end uh, technology on the MU campus. These are mostly imagers. Uh, we want to become one of the best imaging facilities uh, in the Midwest, and our faculty are going to need 
uh, this, this kind of technology if they're going to compete um, uh, over the next few years. So all of these instruments are in place. What these instruments allow us to do is to take information from DNA, from genes, uh, into protein cells so we can con convert genomic data into protein complexes. Complexes make up cells and cells have functions and we can now uh, dissect all of that information from the basic molecular biology to uh, molecular imaging technologies, uh, uh, allowing translation from the lab environment to the clinical environment on a regular basis. To be successful, we need two more instruments, and this is what we're going after now. We're going after a cryo-EM. Cryo-EM is the newest technology that allows uh, our faculty to look at molecular complexes within cells. That's about a five to seven million dollar investment. We're also looking at a seven Tesla MRI instrument so that our clinical faculty can be begin to do high resolution molecular imaging. Um, these technologies will be integrated into what we're going to call the translational precision medicine complex. So very briefly, all right, very briefly, this is, Dr. Choi mentioned that we're at about a 242,000 square feet deficit, uh, and the key areas that we're at deficit are in engineering, medicine, and arts and sciences. This building would foot the bill. This is about 200,000 square feet, about $150 million operation. It's been programmed to be an interdisciplinary building, not the old standard uh, siloed um, uh, uh, concept, but an integrated concept of computation with basic science, with uh, chemistry and biomaterial types of work. Uh, it's programmed for 44 new research faculty, all right? Uh, some, of whom, uh, some of whom will be informatics-driven faculty, all right? Integration of informatics with faculty expertise. This gives us great uh, opportunities in cardiovascular sciences, cancer, regenerative medicine. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to create clean rooms for tissue engineering and various things like that. So it'll integrate chemist, uh, uh, chemistry, engineering, uh, medicine, uh, veterinary medicine, arts and sciences, agriculture, all into one building. All right, the Missouri Innovation Center, if we start thinking about now the products of our faculty's innovation, the Missouri Innovation Center has been very successful since it started. It started with a $10 million investment. We've graduated 18 companies, uh, most of these uh, startup companies. Uh, $20 million of private investment has been raised. We're now, this is the incubator as we know it today. This is the new wing designed, which is about a $15 million estimated cost. Uh, MU isn't going to invest $5 million into this uh, expansion. We're writing the federal government uh, an EDA grant for another $5 million, and the community then is um, um, working on its $5 million toward that investment. Um, just to show you the return on that investment, uh, this is the return that we've done so far, 38 graduated companies, most of which are MU spinoffs, state and local impact, has been pretty significant. 235 million in payroll, 240 new quality jobs uh, for the state. The final uh, piece that I'm going to talk about is a real potential for revenue generation, and that is to add a cyclotron, 70 MeV a mega electron <coughs> volt cyclotron, to our reactor. Our reactor is a unique resource. No one else has a resource like this on their campus. We have chemists and uh, medical physicists and molecular physicists who are able to use a cyclotron to begin to start generating significantly new resources for research and products for the medical industry, all right? Um, for example, theranostic isotope pairs. These are two different isotopes of the same element, one of which is used for imaging and the counterpart of which is used for therapy, for therapeutics. And so we can image and treat patients then using isotopes generated from this reactor, all right? So the MU Office of Economic Development right now is leading an effort to arrange a public-private partnership to develop this project, all right? So that just gives you a flavor of some of the opportunities we have. There are many others. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you. Thank you to the board, and thank you, uh, Dr. Choi, for this opportunity to come and talk to you today. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, something a little different uh, right now. Uh, quite often when we talk about economic development uh, and entrepreneurship, we're focused on uh, the end product of the deal, that is the licensing agreements that take place, uh, the, uh, the, the, th the sellout, if you will, the company startups. But quite often what's missed in this conversation is the science of the deal. And that's one of the things I want to uh, bring our attention to is how the science not only uh, shapes the outcome, but then also contributes wholeheartedly to our economic development and where the investment must lie in my mind. So hopefully what I'd like to do today in the little time I have is to uh, focus your attention on one particular example and what that means for other, other opportunities that we have both on our campus and around the system. So if you can envision the landscape in the years following 9-11 when the, uh, I, the uh, biometric authentication analyses that we typically think about, whether that be fingerprint, voice recognition, facial recognition, iris scanning, retinal scanning, DNA, et cetera, all of these opportunities were available to us. All these tools were available to us. And yet all of them have limitations. And as I said, in the, the years following 9-11, we were very uh, conscious of the fact that we had some uh, gaps that we needed to fill very quickly. And our ability to uh, uh, authenticate identification uh, for Homeland Security issues and others. <clears throat> and quite often, what we were focused on was that in particular, uh, that particular uh, identification possibility is how we could say identify an individual from this distance out to <coughs> across the room. And one of the things that, uh, if you look back here, that many of these fail for various reasons uh, and they don't pass the test of being able to identify someone uh, whether it because of the intrusiveness of the technology or the fact that it uh, requires uh, too much in, uh, 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 there, there are reasons that it could fail for one reason or another. Uh, but it, it came that a group of researchers at UMKC were looking at what the vasculature of the eye could do in terms of developing a fingerprint, if you will, or an eye print, as we call it, for identifying um, uh, what uh, the... Um, what an individual uh, or who the individual was. One of the perfect and beautiful things about the eye print technology is the vascul vasculature of your eye doesn't change uh, over time. And it's completely unique to an individual. As much as we think that the vasculature may change over time, it looks different as time goes by, it's absolutely identical. And in, on top of that, it can be imaged from a distance. So in other words, not only is it something up close, uh, but we could measure across the room who an individual is. So the, the research team at UMKC was very involved in this, uh, and they were thinking of it in those terms. You know, what would uh, this technology mean for uh, personal identification vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, security issues? So the uh, original concept was uh, developed by the research team. Uh, the proof of concept was made, patents filed, patents issued, uh, at that point, the iPrint technology was born, and we began shopping for a CEO for this. Uh, the CEO that stepped up, uh, Toby Rush, uh, working with Reza Derek Shani, uh, began to commercialize the technology. Uh, funding was secured. And interestingly enough, the one thing that really changed the dynamic of this whole opportunity was the fact that the whole research uh, focus had been on uh, this focusing at a distance or identification at a distance, the homeland security issue. But what Toby Rush did when he came to the research team was to say, can we take this technology and put it into an iPhone? And the answer was, let's see. Let's get back to the laboratory and see. Can we take uh, what was a, a rather crude instrument uh, at its inception and put it into a device the size of an iPhone or a, a cell phone? Well, the answer was yes, and uh, it turned out that uh, investors became very interested when we began seeing that the landscape of this changed very rapidly. And in particular, Alipay, uh, the predecessor to Ant Financial uh, Services, which essentially is the PayPal arm to Alibaba. Now, we're talking about an industry that has 500 million, that's half a billion active users. They have 10 to 20,000 transactions per second that will all very soon be using iPrint technology for their commercial services. So 
Currently, we have about 10 million users just based on domestic companies that are using it. But once this now a global uh, technology uh, goes viral, we're going to be looking at hopefully a billion customers by 2020. And this is, in uh, fact, not a uh, fantasy, but reality. And so what first started out as something very crude and then became something very sophisticated simply by translating the technology to uh, cell phone uh, is something that's very impactful. The upshot, in addition, not only the $100 million sellout, uh, but the fact that Ant Financial will keep iVerify in Kansas City. It'll maintain its name. It hires UMKC students. We have about 50 employees uh, right now. Uh, the average salary, about 100,000 per individual. Graduates from our School of Computing Engineering are being hired by Ant Financial's iVerify. And the five-year goal of a billion users, we're well on track to make that happen. The other interesting thing, and probably the most beneficial thing, is that we're going to be looking at creating the largest public-private research partnership by uh, developing with Ant Financial a um, biometric research institute uh, in Kansas City. So what's the next iVerify? Several technologies and spin-offs that are in, in the works. Uh, I won't go into them in detail. You have them in front of you. But one that I want to point out that's most exciting, I think, is the photocleavable on-demand drug delivery. This is a technology where <clears throat> we have a biodegradable uh, depot that is injected into the site where a drug needs to be delivered with the drug in a, with a photocleavable linkage. Uh, when the drug is needed, an armband <coughs> patch wearing, uh, with, an eye, with a light source is triggered. It goes on, and the length of the, uh, the light pulse uh, will dictate the dose of the drug that's delivered to the individual. Uh, patents have been issued on this already. Uh, we're looking for uh, additional investors, but I think this is going to be one of those uh, uh, companies, if you will, that will be the next I verify. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dreyfus. Thank you. Next up is uh, Dr. Wes Harris. And Dr. Harris, I'll, I'll share with you how much time you have left, so if you... Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, well. <coughs> I, I'm personally, uh, we've been hearing a lot about the science and technology, and I happen to be a chemist, so I think all this is great, these opportunities uh, that we've been discussing. And ironically, my assignment is to talk about the non-science and technology uh, research uh, going on using examples from the uh, UMSL campus to illustrate uh, what we're doing. Uh, that's... Okay, we're missing a couple of slides. Um, so what I was going to have on the slide was a, was a brief summary of some of the financial uh, data for non-STEM research, but I was going to caution you against overemphasizing the distinction. Uh, STEM and non-STEM are not real strict definitions, so there's a lot of research going on which is clearly non-STEM, there's research going on which is clearly STEM, and there's a fuzzy part in the middle. So we don't really obsess uh, over tracking STEM versus uh, non-STEM research. On the, the campus, uh, the units that do non-STEM research, the College of Education has about 1.9 million in non-STEM research. College of Nursing has over 500,000. Uh, social Work has about 350,000. Business was doing about 180. That was before business uh, landed their contract for the accelerator down at Cortex. So we're pleased that the FY17 numbers are going to look much, much better for business than, than FY16 did. But what I wanted to get onto was this discussion of some specific programs. So on our campus, the premier non-STEM uh, department is criminology and criminal justice. It's the best social science department we have. It's been ranked number four by U.S. Uh, News and World Report. It's ranked number seven by academic analytics. And that's not rankings among the R2 schools, the schools our size. That's a national ranking. So they are a top ten department for, uh, for the country and they bring in about half a million dollars in funding. They have a very distinguished faculty, as you might guess, and so Dr. Esbenson is a Des Lee professor, Dr. Lordson is a curator's distinguished professor, Rosenfeld is a Thomas Jefferson professor, and we've had other curators professors that are not on this list because they could have retired, more likely they were hired away. When you have very good people 
other universities want them. And so one thing I would like to praise this department for is it's very good at sustaining itself. So even though it's relying now on some distinguished senior faculty members, when we look downstream at the associate and assistant professors, we see a lot of very energetic talent coming forward. <coughs> it's an excellent department now, and I'm very confident in projecting it's going to remain an excellent department for the foreseeable future. Uh, I wanted to focus on a few specific projects from this department to illustrate the non-STEM research. Uh, Dr. Esbenson has a $1.6 million grant from MIJ to look at the uh, comprehensive school safety initiative, uh, the UMSL initiative. Dr. Hubner has recently gotten a $2.2 million grant from the MacArthur Foundation for the St. Louis County Safety and Justice Challenge, and Dr. Rosenfeld has NIJ money for a project that is really trying to take a somewhat comprehensive look at the law enforcement judicial system in the St. Louis metropolitan area. And I picked these three programs to illustrate a couple of points. One is that they, uh, they do happen to bring in a fair amount of money in case uh, you're interested in, in that sort of information. But also they show the connection to the St. Louis community. All of these research projects have uh, a connection. But I want to illustrate how that connection works. They draw data from the local community. But uh, what I want to stress is that the research is not local. The research from this work emerges as top-tier publications in, in, in national and international journals, and the research moves the field of criminology and criminal justice. But what our faculty are very good at doing is circling back around and making sure that the results of that research impacts the local community. Uh, another illustration of the synergism between social science research and the community is Dr. S uh, Swanstrom from the Political Science Department. He was hired as, <coughs> also as the Des Lee Professor for Community Collaboration, so working with the community is basically part of his job description. And one of the things he's done is to start this Community Builders Association. This is a group that he has assembled of, of municipal leaders in the municipalities surrounding UMSL in the North St. Louis County area. It's municipal leaders, it's nonprofit leaders, it's lenders, it's other business interests. And he works to bring these groups together to uh, address local problems, to see what the problems are and what the resources are that can be brought to bear to solve this. So it's a classic example of service back to the community. But the point <coughs> I want to stress is this is not done at the sacrifice of scholarly activity. Dr. Swanstrom has published 12 books on community-engaged uh, research. And so the model that I would present to you is not that community service and research compete with each other. The model that I would present is that we are in an urban environment. We take very talented faculty members and put them in that environment, and they pull from that environment data and insights which then feed into their scholarly activity. And the result of that scholarly activity is service back to the community. So it's not either or. The service is the natural product of the scholarship that goes on at the campus. Uh, so just quickly, I was going to talk about some mental health uh, research areas uh, that is another strength of the campus. This cuts across a broad number of colleges and schools and can be divided up into sort of four basic areas. We do the Missouri Institute of Mental Health has a very close working relationship with the Missouri Department of Mental Health. They work together to write grants to the federal government when that money comes back to the state a good chunk of it flows back down to the campus to support program evaluations that assist the state in a number of important programs. Uh, the highest priority now is probably trying to deal with the well-recognized uh, epidemic of opioid uh, addiction that's plaguing the state uh, and the country. We also have clinical services coming out of the mental health area. These are externally funded programs the Community uh, Psychological Services runs a clinic on the campus that uh, services mainly children from the North County area. And because of their success in generating external funding, they're able to provide these services on an ability to pay basis. And so they're providing mental health services to a community for individuals that otherwise probably wouldn't be able to afford that kind of service. Center for uh, Child Advocacy Services also operates on external funding 
and provides mental health services to uh, children in the metropolitan region that have suffered uh, trauma from sexual abuse, uh, crime victims, and that sort of thing. Uh, let me skip over. We also have some basic research in mental health that's important, and these are the two people to illustrate that, Dr. Tate and Dr. Paul. They both use magnetic resonance imaging, one of the techniques that was discussed earlier uh, in their research. And they have slightly different focuses. Dr. Tate focuses on the using MRI to image the brain as a result of, of neurotrauma and gets extensive DOD funding to look at the effect of chronic low-level trauma on service members and veterans. And Dr. Paul runs a more traditional NIH-funded uh, basic research program that uses MRI to study brain injury in that population. And lastly, uh, one more slide disappeared. I was going to list some other departments on the campus that are highly ranked in academic analytics. We have, I think, uh, ten de eight departments that rank in the top 10 percent among our two institutions. And so I just wanted to leave the message that, that is in the non-STEM area, there is a breadth of really excellent scholarship that's going on in multiple departments on, on the AMSL campus and in multiple departments on the other campuses, uh, the other system campuses as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Dr. Marissa Crow. Thank you, curators and President Choi. <clears throat> Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is the importance of corporate research. Um, I think uh, this is going to leverage off of what Dick Brow talked about this morning. Um, that's just a nice little saying. We'll skip on to this. Um, so what I really want to point out here is where uh, does university research funding come from? Um, and so there are a couple of really, I think, pertinent things I, I would like to point out here. So first of all, we can see here that federal funding is, of course, the largest share of R&D funding at universities. Um, I would like to point out also that a lot of the research done on university campuses is actually funded by the university itself. Um, and this comes in the fact that many federal sources, such as Department of Energy, will require what we call cost share, which means that the university is responsible for doing, you know, up to like 25 or 30 percent of cost share of any funding that comes in. So we do do fund a lot of our own research from internal sources. <coughs> Industry up here. This is in uh, a little bit. So you would think that. You know, industry is such a small portion of the research funding that goes on on campus, but it is, especially in the STEM fields, a very important component of the research that we do. So let me talk a little bit about our campus in particular. So our new awards for last year, 2016, um, federal is, of course, um, as we would expect, the very largest portion. But you can see here on Missouri S&T's campus, that even though we saw on the previous chart that industry was a small pro proportion of the research universities across the United States, at Missouri S&T, industry is one-third of our research. Um, and so I would like to talk to you a little bit about how we have developed that and sustained that. And I think Dick Brow talked about that a little bit this morning. So a large portion of our research that we do comes from our consortiums. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we have structured those, how we've developed them, and, and really what their structure is. So our consortiums are based off of members. Um, so we will have a consortium around a very specific topic, and industry will pay a membership. So each <clears throat> company, so we have you know, full memberships for large companies, and if it's a small company, they would be an associate member at a, at a lower. And so what they do is they pay this membership, they throw it into a pot. And all of the research that is developed by that consortium is shared among all of the members. So all of the intellectual property, all of the research results are shared by that member. And in this pot, the members then vote on um, or, or select the research projects that are going to be done. And you can see here, so I think Dick talked about our three largest this morning, but we also have intelligent maintenance, um, a microgrid, that's one of our newest ones. Um, so we're hoping to build that. And the particle gel, I think Tom Schumann talked a little bit about his uh, industry consortium this morning. And he said ConocoPhillips is, is set to, uh, to join theirs. 
So um, to talk a little bit about how uh, we've developed the consortium, as he pointed out this morning, um, the National Science Foundation actually has a really good structure that we have built our consortiums on, which is called the NSF IU Industry University Collaborative Research Centers, IUCRCs. Um, and so these are set up so that all the members pay a, a predefined membership rate. And that, that number varies really depending on the industry, because some industries can, um, can have a much larger share, other industries are smaller. Um, so the member, there's multiple memberships, there's varied level of intellectual property rights. So because all of the research is shared amongst all of the member companies, um, there is some very particular intellectual property language on that. Basically it's first right of refusal of, between the member companies. Um, and so these consortiums are really a collaboration between the faculty, the students, and the industry members. So they are very tightly coordinated um, between um, all of the partners. And so it's not uncommon within these consortiums that, that the, the students and the faculty will have weekly <coughs> teleconferences, distance conferences with their industry partners. Many of the students will go out and they'll do co-ops or internships at the companies. It's a very tight research operation. And I think it benefits the faculty. You know, we often hear that, you know, we're in our academic ivory tower. This is not true with these projects. And the students spend a lot of time. So we're developing a really strong, rigorous workforce. Oh. <clears throat> then the next thing, so as I said before, there's some particulars about uh, intellectual property rights. Now, sometimes research will come up that a particular company finds is very interesting, and they want to kind of take it offline and keep it to themselves. Then they would go into an associate project. And so this is a project they fund outside of the consortium. And you can usually see it's, it's usually for a much larger, where they want to take now that technology so that they can own it. Um, I also want to say one other thing that our university system has, which is very attractive to industry and also helps promote industry on our campus, is our uh, UM, we call it BPM 203, Facilities and Administration Cost Recovery, FNA. So let me first of all just tell everybody what FNA is. This is something that's very close to the heart, obviously, of all the, uh, the CROs here. But um, this is what we call indirect. Now, some of you have, may have heard on the federal level that there has been some discussion about cutting the FNA um, at NIH and other, um, uh, other federal agencies. And I'd like to say that we, you know, the, the FNA is, is our bread and butter. And so what FNA is, it stands for Facilities and Administration. So you've seen, you know, if we have a research, we have foundries, we have a nuclear reactor. The electricity and utilities costs for those things, heat, um, all of those, that has to come from somewhere. And those things are typically not written in as line items in a budget. They are this F and A percent. Um, and so when we talk about cutting that, that's, that's not a tax. You know, and many people think this is a tax on, on what we're doing. No, it's not. It's a real thing. And administration is people. So we have to have people, you know, who, who administer the financial resources, who help get the proposals out the door. Um, and we have to have technicians, for example, to run the equipment, to run the nuclear reactors. Those people's salaries are paid from the administration part of the FNA. Okay, so just quickly to, to follow up, we have uh, the UM system has a very nice thing which says that we may charge a company a higher rate than the federally negotiated um, FNA rate, and then we can give them more of the IP rights. We can sign it over directly. And so this is something here at S&T that we've started doing far more frequently. Um, because in many cases, um, a company does not necessarily want the, intellig the intellectual property rights to go develop them. They just want to hold them so no one else develops them. So they have no intention of actually trying to get money from it. So now what we're going to do is we charge them more money, and they sit and they hold that patent. And so it's a win-win situation on both both parts. We get more money, they get to hold the patent rights. And so I think we are now ready for, for Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crow. All right, Dr. Caruso.
Mike? Can you give him a wireless? Okay. Okay. Yes. Good. All right. Thank you for this opportunity to brief you on an initiative that aims to bring greater than $4 billion to the Kansas City corridor over the next 10 years. This concept of One Health Intelligence is based on wanting to bring actionable information to individuals. That actionable information is used to drive behavior change. This program is really about combining the Internet of Things with the Precision Medicine Initiative, with the One Health Initiative, with Precision Agriculture, all things that are smart and connected. That's what One Health Intelligence is really about. We want to run this as a pilot in the Kansas City corridor between Manhattan and Columbia, scooping down to grab Rolla. And we believe that we have the capabilities in this region to move forward on this in terms of the expertise, the equipment, and the facilities, and the patient population. The patient population includes civilians, it includes active duty military, and it includes veterans. The vision or the concept for this is broken down into three categories or classes of information. So up here in the top left, we call this traceability. So not only do you know that you consumed a hamburger or a lotion anything that was ingested in the skin or in the body, but you have a traceable record of that <coughs> steer that came from the slaughterhouse and what happened after that steer was packaged. Bacterial sensors, temperature sensors that record as a function of time and then automatically port that information over to your smart device. And then not only do you know that information, but you can track backwards from that to know whether there was antibiotics, deworming medication, the quality of the hay, the quality of the water in Dodge City, Kansas, where these feedlots are, to be able to trace back and find out, this is why I have high tin levels in my blood, is because of this piece. So that's traceability. In the top right is geolocation-based information. So just based on your GPS position alone, we already have data out there that tells us about air quality, water quality, sun exposure for vitamin D conversion, weather conditions, communicable disease, housing conditions, all of these pieces of information can be used to inform one about their health and improve their overall quality of health. So now we have traceability and geolocation-based information that we want to combine with personal information. So the things that are in your electronic medical record. That might include your sleep quality, your lipid panels, your genomic behavior, your exercise, your stress level, the time of year in which this happens. So this is really the vision. But in order to make this vision happen, we need to be able to come up with new and better sensors, repackage those sensors, to figure out how we're going to transfer these megabytes to terabytes worth of information on individuals and hold them, how we're going to get this information back out to the average Kansan or Missourian, and ultimately how to do this responsibly so that it is not used for discriminatory purposes for employment or insurance or otherwise. This program is a true public-private community partnership in which we are seeking 80% of the total funding from the feds to push these technologies through the valley of death and have the corridor tech partners, the large tech partners, come in and fund the remaining 10 to 20 percent. The corridor community provides the plants, the animals, and the humans to study. And the small business comes in to fill in the gaps where the large tech companies don't exist or can't uh, compete. This is an example of the types of capabilities that exist in this region that would enable this kind of mission to be able to prove out this concept in the Kansas City corridor. So some of the big ones include Sprint and Honeywell, Cerner and Garmin as examples of corporations that are known for being able to bring technology all the way to commercial transition. Not just to sit at the university scale, 
but to go all the way through. And that's really what differentiates this program. There was a study done at the University of Missouri, Columbia, by Professor Marilyn Rance. She had an accelerometer, just a motion sensor, a heart rate monitor, and a motion sensor in the room of independent living seniors. Those three pieces of information. From those three <coughs> pieces of information, they tracked how those people were doing, and they could intervene when they saw that something was different in one of those three sensors. By doing that, they were able to extend the time that they were in independent living before they went to advanced care by 1.8 years. At $87,000 per year per patient, that translates into tens, if not hundreds of billions in savings for Medicare. And that's just a small slice of what this can do. Okay? There are the disadvantaged who don't have access to health care, who could have access to something like a wearable, something really cheap and simple wearable in order to have an, a virtual physician give them guidance on how they can improve their health. Veterans have special needs, and there are almost no clinical trials on children. This is a safe way to be able to get more information on children. We're trying to stand up this program for a start in FY19. The request is 400 million per year in the beginning from the feds, tapering off to zero after the 10-year period, with internal research and development dollars increasing over that time. The in-kind contributions include those from the corridor community, so counting the time of the people who would be part of this study and the ants, animals, and the plants. The only way that this type of program is going to succeed is if we are sensitive to being responsible. Genomic security is paramount in ensuring that people would be willing to allow their data to be compared. We don't want that to use for, for discriminatory purposes. We want to make sure that there is a balance between the local farmers who would be allowing us to study their animals and what they're actually putting into their animals. That you have some sort of artificial intelligence that could be providing a recommendation and how to ultimately roll that out so that you get trust among the people. You don't just jump straight to having some sort of AI-based physician. And then lastly, how do we identify this level of data? Do we do this at the, at the level of each individual or do we completely de-identify it according to the HIPAA de-identifiers which doesn't allow for as much correlation and information. So for example, if we use the HIPAA de-identifiers, that doesn't allow you to identify by zip code. So if you saw that there were high lead levels, you wouldn't be able to say that in the greater Detroit area there's a big problem with lead. Okay? So we would love to have that information to be able to pinpoint and say this is where we're having a problem, but not at the cost of having it being used for nefarious purposes. Thank you, Dr. Caruso. I, I have a question. There were a couple of uh, things that, uh, that registered with me. You said $4 billion and that this would be unique. Are there other universities that are thinking of something like this as a One Health network? There are. There are tens, if not hundred universities that are all playing in this area. There are federal agencies that are playing this area. There are lots of industry that are playing in this area. But no one is trying to bring it all together and take it forward to commercial transition. When we go out to Washington, D.C. and brief on this, the VA, who runs the Million Veteran Program, doesn't know what's happening over on the military health system side and they're not coordinating well with the NIH. So we're almost a coordinator in just trying to bring all of this together. And <clears throat> for that four billion, if we think about bringing this level of economic development to the region, we're talking about a significant impact on the $293 billion GDP of the state of Missouri. That was a point that Bob Schwartz had raised. 
Questions, comments? I, I have some questions about, um, about the, uh, first of all, great presentations, all of them. Uh, congratulations, I think it, it, it's, it's tremendous. Um, I have some questions about the IP because I think, and I'm not sure who this is directed to, but I believe those contracts are negotiated via campus. But I'm also thinking that the um, general counsel is consolidated at the system level. So help me understand who handles that stuff. I can take a first shot at that, and then I'll let Marisa chime in since it was her topic. We do have an IP Bob. management office. Bob. Yes. Can you put the mic Microphone. in front of you. Oh, sure. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we do have an IP office at System, but we also have independent tech transfer offices on each of the campuses. So we work very closely with them. Uh, IP management uh, at the system level is coordinated by a gentleman in my office named Scott Ullman. They have a small team. They do a variety of things like fund the patent costs that occur on the campuses. But um, there's a close working relationship, and uh, the campuses also work very closely independently with their faculty as they look at that. So when you get the licensing revenue, does that stay with you, or does that there's not building dorms with that money? Uh, no, we're not. Uh, most of the money is pumped right, ba right back into the, uh, to IP and trying to do more with it. Uh, there's a distribution that involves a third going to the inventor, and then a third goes to the system. Uh, to the campus and to the uh, department where the invention occurred. So a lot of it does go back in, and Mark mentioned this, a lot of the imaging uh, equipment that they've paid for was paid for with IP revenue. Uh, the patent costs are paid for with IP revenue, and we subsidize the operation at system level at least with IP revenue, and I know that occurs at least at MU. And that, is that similar with the Missouri Innovation Center? Uh, M MIC up. has a, uh, I guess I'd describe it as a unique relationship with the university. They have some independence, but we were certainly instrumental, particularly the MU campus, in putting up their facility. And uh, the, once the technologies get to a particular stage, uh, depending upon the company, there can be a relationship with the university or they can go their own way. On uh, Mark's slide, he highlighted that MIC, the companies had 20 million in uh, private investment. There was also some SBIR, SB, STTR dollars from uh, the federal government. So really depends on the specific company. And I guess one final question. Uh, when it comes to the intellectual property, and, and again, forgive me because I'm, I'm new here, but I know there's publishing rights. We get to, you know, we get to publish, and that's very important. Do we always get a licensing fee, or what does that look like? Or do we get it 40% of the time, or...? If it's licensed, there would all be, always be some type of fee that comes back. We also, in certain instances, have allowed companies to just take off and run with it. There will be things where, instances, for example, where we will do an IP waiver. Let's say a company is very uh, sensitive about the disclosure of a result that we get from research. We can sit on that for a week, a month, a year, whatever, but that's typically uh, negotiated with the company. And we do that for that company because they're providing significant resources. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. Okay. Thank so you very much. You, you kind of negotiate the deal right up front with the company. Is Can be. Right? Mm -hmm. And we also work very closely with general counsel's office on that. Steve has an attorney in his office that we work very closely with on uh, both what we're trying to do globally with IP and also with specific companies. If I can ask a question to make sure I'm right, uh, well, one, two things. I would encourage any curator to get by the incubator at Mizzou and talk to Bill Turpin, who, who is running that, who is really pretty remarkable. Uh, but, but two things. What, what, what he has explained to me is that the world is changing from industry's interest in patents to what they are really interested in is spin-off mm. uh, companies and what they're trying to do is build more room and more space for more spin-off companies. Is that That's correct. That right? That's correct. Yep. But what I think is particularly important as a debate for us to have and have further discussions on is whether or not you really want to lock down all IP. You can get to a point where you discourage industry mm -hmm. if you try to lock it down. I have been told, whether it's right or wrong, and Mark or Bobby might comment on it, that much of the success of uh, Silicon Valley and Stanford has been that they were not real tight on it and that when these companies became successful, the philanthropy became extraordinary. Would you, Mark and Bob, would you comment on yeah, that? Yeah, let me, let me comment quickly, then I want to allow some of the others to chime in. 
you mentioned Bill Turpin, and uh, he is uh, from Silicon Valley. He ran a, started a number of businesses out there. We're very fortunate to have him as a director of the uh, Missouri Innovation Center. And, uh, you know, we've talked earlier a lot about the need to retain, uh, attract and retain the best faculty. That goes with people like Bill, and one of the reasons he came here was because of the ecosystem in the Columbia area. And a lot of that has to do with the folks at Columbia, but also the gentleman sitting at the back of the room, uh, Hank Foley, who was very instrumental in bringing Bill here. Uh, Kuter Steelman also mentioned the way uh, companies are changing how they do business. It's really true. There's a lot of corporate acquisitions of startup companies these days. In fact, you heard uh, Lawrence Dreyfus talk with the iVerify example. That was more than a $100 million purchase of a university technology and a university-based startup. So there's a lot of that that's occurring as well. Yeah, and I think uh, that uh, it's a really important point, and Hank uh, uh, really uh, began to change the way we thought about IP and, and our interactions with the commercial uh, sector. Um, we have to be flexible. We have to, we have to, um, uh, we can't be, um, um, <coughs> can't be stubborn about the way that we handle IP. We have to be flexible enough to see what the needs of the company are and what our own needs are and, um, and, and negotiate what's the best deal uh, for both parties in, in that situation. There are lots of times when we'll look at the situation and we'll waive the IP back to the investigator or we'll waive our portions of the costs uh, to the company so that we can get them to invest in it. Uh, a little more significantly. So uh, they'll be much more willing to, to invest if they have uh, a piece of the action at the end. So One other thing, and again, just what I've been told, uh, people like Bill, who I trust immensely, I, I, I think that Bob was a little, when he talked about small companies, things like Turpin was involved in Borland, JavaScript, and Netscape, <laughs> little startups that you might have heard of. Uh, but the... The other thing that I have been told, and this is an issue that we always face in higher ed, and we joke about it, but sometimes higher education moves slowly. Uh, in today's world, industry and business and innovation does not want to move slowly. And that our industry partners want to hear from us quickly as to the structure and how we do these agreements. And that if we go through maybe some of the processes that we have been used to in the past, there are other institutions out there who are not as afraid of change and moving quickly and that puts us at a disadvantage. Mark, would you comment on that? Right, you're, 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 you're exactly correct. We, uh, historically, we are very slow uh, by industry standards um, and, and, and uh, the way to get around that is to make sure that uh, we are uh, negotiating up front with, um, with um, legal counsel and so on about standard agreements that we can that we can just very quickly activate in very specific circumstances. There will be some circumstances where there has to be, it, it'll be a unique uh, partnership that we have to negotiate all, all the way through the process. But most of these agreements will be, uh, will fit into one box or another box that we, that we, we can standardize. Where are we with that process? Have, have we got the standardization that you believe we need in our interactions? With Not completely, but I, I think we, uh, we um, because of our recent successes, because of the kinds of experience that we now have under our belt compared to where we were when I first came to the University of Missouri, uh, where it might take years to get one of those agreements in place. Um, I think we've, we've got enough experience now where, where we're negotiating in good faith on a, on a, uh, on a pretty effective basis. Um, not to say that there, we don't stumble along the way, uh, but yeah, uh, we, we still have a lot of work to do in that area, but we're, we're moving down the um, process pretty effectively. And we're turning out more and more um, uh, uh, patents, more and more license agreements uh, um, each and every year. Uh, I, I just want to echo what Curator Lehman said. I appreciate all of your efforts. I mean, it, we talk about it. The, the lifeblood of the research institution is in your hands to a great extent. I, I just Mark. wanted to ask a question really quick. Well, first of all, thank you all for your presentations. I thought it was really great. But in all these efforts and all these successes that you have had, do you feel like the university system is doing a good job of publicizing these for you and, and putting them out for showcase? Uh, just in the, you know, outside of your industry-specific publications, do you think the university system as a whole could be doing a better job of getting your message out there and the successes you've had? I, I I can certainly speak for the MU campus. Uh, we have not historically done a very good job 
Uh, sci scientists are poor communicators, um, quite frankly. Uh, and um, we are uh, investing very heavily because we have the expertise on our campus in particular, the world's best journalism school. We now have communications programs uh, actively going on on campus to where our STEM uh, um, uh, discoveries and so on are reaching the media much more quickly than they were before. And they're reaching the media in, um, in a language that the communities can understand. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. And, and, and we're investing very heavily in extension and engagement in trying to get, even, even in the state of Missouri, we don't, we don't tell the state very well uh, what we do and what the impact of our work is uh, in, around the state. That's, that's a very important uh, objective for the next couple of years. I Mark, I want to, in, a bit, in, your, in your presentation, you talked about opportunities, but you also identified threats. I want to talk about one of the threats you mentioned, and uh, you identified it as uh, uh, limited or few collaborations among campuses. Are, are we maximizing the collaboration that opportunities that are available for campuses to work together? I assume from you listing that as a threat that we perhaps are not, but that seems to be some low-hanging fruit that uh, we could turn around almost immediately. And uh, I'd appreciate what, what the panel thinks about that. So One Health Intelligence is one example of how we're trying to bring that together. It requires the basic sciences for the sensors, the engineers to prototype them. It requires the philosophy departments to talk about the ethics of this, all the medical schools, the vet schools, Everybody has to come together in order to make that happen. It's truly not only cross university, but cross the system. But are we doing it? We are, we are in specific areas, Curator Graham, and we have had uh, system funding proposals uh, and opportunities where we provide seed money to try to bring individuals together. I would say that I, my personal opinion is the results of those were mixed. I think there were some good things that came out of them, some others that did not. Uh, I think it's an interesting area where we could be doing more. I think the question would be, what's the best vehicle? What's the best way to do that? Does that need a system push? For example, do we need to host uh, a workshop in a specific area where we try to attract faculty from each of the campuses to pull together a proposal team? I think if we're going to take that approach, we need to identify or pre-identify the opportunity we're going to go after, just pulling people together. You know, I think there's benefit that occurs in that, but I think it has to be more. I think we have to maybe have something targeted and then pull them together. So I personally think we could do more. Yeah, you know, actually, the, the interesting thing is that investigators are very, um, very good at finding uh, areas where they can collaborate. And it doesn't make any difference if it's uh, on the campus, among our campuses, or even with uh, other institutions. They're very good at finding those uh, opportunities. Um, as an institution, we we need to make sure that we don't put any barriers in the way uh, in order to let those things happen. And in fact, what we have to do is create more of what we call uh, intellectual collisions, right? We need to put them in the rooms together. We need to give them opportunities to be together and they're gonna do things like uh, Tony's doing here and they're gonna drive these kinds of bigger ideas. Um, um, and, and, and then as an institution, we have to find a way to support that that kind of an interaction. For instance, do the six of you uh, meet with any regularity and, and, and talk about these things and how one campus can, can help the other and, and uh, do those yeah, work? I'll take that. We, uh, we meet by telepresence once about every five weeks or so. And we have a variety of things on the agenda. Uh, for example, on next week's agenda, we'll be talking about uh, the Ameren Accelerator and some of the work Humsel's doing there to try to look to determine how the different campuses can partner. Uh, we have other topics that are on there. Um, I don't know that we dive deep enough down to, to look at very specific things. That could be something we could add to that. Thank you. Um, can I ask one more question? Uh, to piggyback off what Chairman Graham said, is the Missouri Innovation Center, is that more siloed or is that, does that work with all the campuses? Um, I'm, I'm not aware of a um, spinoff that's come out of uh, UMKC or um, our s and or, or UMSL, um, are you? No, and I think so, it, it, it so. could be a little bit siloed in the sense that uh, 
there may not be great recognition among the other campuses of that facility, although we have met there as uh, a group. And I think it's actually uh, the times that we have met there have been very uh, instructive. And so I think moving in that direction would help. Just getting more information out to the campuses on what's happening there because uh, Bill does a terrific job and I think he has a lot to offer. And so I think we can do a better job and, and uh, both pulling in and then pushing that out. And maybe it means having Bill uh, you know, do a little uh, show around the, the, the right. state, you know, bringing what they're offering to our various campuses and then meet back there again. So. But, uh, and that's why that tier two expansion is gonna be really critical. I mean, we don't have, uh, that space is fully occupied now uh, as it is. We have to wait for our company to graduate before that's we can even bring in another. So there are a lot of, there's a backlog of people trying to get into that center uh, at this stage of the game to get their businesses off the ground. Uh, that this kind of a partnership means that an expansion like that is absolutely critical. I think. Uh, I, thank you. L let me add to that that the Missouri Innovation Center was funded last year with an appropriation, and, and prior to that, but we we made a special appropriation last year, and I asked the very question that, that you asked uh, because it is Columbia focused, and it was and and I thought well that's fine because Colum uh, Columbia has a a different population a different uh, a commercial base, uh, but similar things exist on the other campuses, particularly S&T and UMKC. And, and so largely because of the, uh, uh, the businesses that exist. <coughs> so when you ask the question about the, is the Missouri Innovation Center system, you know, there ought to be cooperation between them, but it certainly is entrepreneurial in Kansas City, and there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, work that goes on there, probably more than in Columbia, but now the funding is available in Columbia, not because of the, uh, the engineering, the medical schools, uh, uh, you know, the Cerners that populate that, that area. Each, each region, uh, Cuter Phillips brings up a really interesting point, each region has its own entrepreneurial ecosystem and how they de get innovation to marketplace and how they grow jobs. Some of the businesses that uh, grew out of the Columbia campus that went through the Innovation Center, partly because of lack of space in Columbia, are now in St. Louis. So we do try to look at um, what we try to do driving both research and economic development statewide. It's not just Columbia focused. Curator Chapman had a question. Yes. Um, Good morning, everyone. But I'm from St. Louis, and I'm, I've been really impressed with how the plant science ecosystem has evolved in, in St. Louis. And I want to make sure that as a system that we're taking advantage of that. And I think that's, I think a system approach would be great because we've got some specialization, I think, at our universities that could really make us a player in that environment. And I'm talking about Cortex, Bridge Park, um, all the stuff going on at Danforth. You know, we've got this Ag Innovation Showcase that we have every year. What are we doing as a system to utilize UMSL's physical presence and some of the other specialized, um, um, specialized skills that we have at the, other, at the other campuses to make sure that we're a player? Wash U is doing a great job, and they're taking in millions and millions of dollars every year in research dollars, building the relationships. I, when I go to Cortex, I see other universities in St. Louis, they have offices and a presence there where they're interacting and mingling with people all the time. Are we aggressively pursuing, um, pursuing those relationships and those dollars and those opportunities? I, I would say we are. In, in terms of the Danforth Plant Science Center, we've had a cooperative relationship with them for a long time. There are, there are faculty who do research both on the UMSL campus and at the Danforth Center. There are UMSL graduate students that work at the Danforth Center. Uh, a somewhat similar arrangement with Missouri Botanical Garden. There, we've had dozens of PhD students who have really done their research at the Botanical Garden. In terms of Cortex, we are aggressively moving into that space. We have been involved in Cortex from sort of a managerial point of view for quite a while, but with the uh, Ameren Accelerator, that's really our first significant step into establishing a physical footprint in the Cortex district. So when you go there now, you will see UMSL signage up for, for that accelerator, and I think that's going to be the, the future for this sort of economic development in the St. Louis region. Rather than trying to build our own infrastructure, Cortex is there, and mm -hmm. we're simply going to try to become a more active player. 
And that, that will work well because somebody mentioned the, the ecosystem and, and what entrepreneurs want is that critical mass of people around them. And so we you, you really don't want to try to start an isolated program. We want to feed into this rich ecosystem that's already there. And the UMSL accelerator is really our first uh, significant step into that, and, and we think the first of many such steps into the core test directory. And, and that sounds good. I've, I, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Are you, is UMSL able to tap into the resources at, at, at Mizzou, at S&T, and UMKC, whoever it may be, to assist you in that? Because I think from a system approach, we can really make an impact. We're, we're essentially beginning that process now. Dr. Schwartz referred to the next uh, CRO's meeting, and one of the agenda items that will be there is a representative from the UMSL Accelerate, or the Ameren, sorry, Ameren Accelerator Program is going to be talking to all the CROs to uh, begin to establish how we can start drawing the technical expertise from across the system to assist those startup companies. So. UMSL is, is taking the lead in establishing that accelerator program, but the technical expertise is going to draw from across the system. And that's always been an important part of that program, that the companies want to see a system involvement. They want access to the broader expertise from all four campuses. So we're doing that. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Curator Snowden. Yes. I'd like to go back to Mark's comment about education moves too slow for for industry uh, but we're doing a better job or I think that's the way you phrased it or, and I assume we'll continue to do a better job I guess my question is though are there other schools out there that are premier that we ought to be looking to that have done it really right for a long time and are doing it better all the time and can we jump start to the point where we we look at some of those and and try to move ourselves even ahead you know catch yeah. up and go ahead, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I don't know if you remember, but when Hank first came on board, uh, he had a five-point slide uh, that was very important. And one of the points that he made very clearly is there are people out there who are doing some of these things much better than we are, and we need to go learn from those people. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The, the processes are out there. The examples are out there. Let's go learn from those things. Uh, from that, he brought the uh, venture mentoring system from MIT onto our campus, and now we have a very robust venture mentoring system where, where some of our own um, uh, alumni who are in the business industry are now working with us on the campus with our young op entrepreneurs and our new business ideas and helping us get those to a point of being attractive to business in a much more effective way than we ever did before. So, so it's evolving to a better status all the time. That's it right. just takes a little time. I mean, you can't, you just it, can't flip the switch it, and say, hey, well, you're going to do it this way now. Yeah, no, you can't just flip the switch, but uh, we, we have to accelerate our learning curve uh, for these kinds of things because uh, as you've heard from all of these presentations, uh, Dr. Choi's presentation, Dr. Schwartz's presentation, the amount of resources that we're going to get from federal government and this and the other is going to continue to dwindle and state government is going to continue to dwindle. We have got to drive our own revenue sources if we're going to continue to grow our research enterprises. And so we have to find ways to do that. I'd like to add to that in the comment that when we started the deal with iVerify and Toby Rush came in, uh, Toby is a serial, serial entrepreneur, so this wasn't Toby's uh, first uh, dance, and so he knew quite well what he needed as an entrepreneur and to move the technology forward. He was really shocked at, at the, the slow pace of how we were working, not just us at UMKC, just, it was a, a systemic issue. And so one of the things that we did once we got the deal moving, and, and Toby really helped us in how we managed some of those legal uh, partnerships, was to have him come in and talk to us specifically on what the he needs. And so I think one of the ways that we can approach this is to look at other entrepreneurs like Toby, bring them in and say, how can we serve you best? How can, now obviously we can't give away uh, the party, you know, uh, but nonetheless we can use them to inform us what they really need to help drive uh, the initiative their way. Now we were fortunate that Toby was an exceptional entrepreneur and a CEO, uh, which those two things don't always go together. And uh, he really uh, stuck with us and helped us and guided us. And to this day, I think it's one of the reasons that I verify, despite the fact that it's no, now owned by Ant Financial, is remaining in Kansas City because they want to work with us. Very good. 
I have one other question I'd like to ask Dr. Caruso, and that is with regard to your medical initiative, I noticed that Lawrence is not included in this. KU, KU is on the, uh, if you go to the, uh, if you go to the sheet that has the partners on it, it's a well, couple it's got, slides past got that Manhattan, one. Kansas City, Columbia, and Rolla. Yes, sir. It's not on the map, but they are included in the partner list. Okay, they are. Very good. Sir. Curator Farmer. This really isn't a question. Sorry, I just kind of want to echo what Curator Chapman said. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in St. Louis, and I'd like to know more about what exists in Kansas City, but the Cortex is such an amazing opportunity this state has, and I think it's great that UMSL is seriously looking at putting a space there. I think that it would be really great for the UM system as a whole to look at having a presence there and where I, I spent a lot of time going in and out of there. I think it would be a great platform for everybody in the state of Missouri to learn all about our individual campuses and all the great research that we have going on there. Yeah, I might add, we had a, a CRO meeting there uh, about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago or so, and it was terrific. It was my first exposure to it, and it was really uh, very inspirational. So I, I would echo that to say that just getting us over there uh, and being in that space uh, is really transformative. So I think that's really important to do, would support that wholeheartedly. I'd like so, to. Just let me emphasize very quick. We're not looking to put a space there. We're there. I mean, the, we're in that district now. So we're great. Curator Phillips. Yeah, I'd like to go back to Mark because that was such a great vision. Somebody once said, uh, make no small plans. And the vision that you put forward, you know, is really energizing. Um, but there, it seems to me there are two different ways of, of uh, appreciating research. One is when you're funded for the sake of research, but you don't have a stake in the commercialization of it. And the other is when you are involved in research and you have a stake in it, in equity, or are able to participate in the commercial, uh, commercialization, even if we don't have internally the expertise to, to commercialize it, like E-Verify. And uh, th what you talked about, the, the One Health Intelligence, seems to me to initially depend on federal funding. And uh, some of the materials that we were given, actually most materials that we were given were 2013-2014, uh, where the, the federal, we could look forward to similar or increased federal funding, and that picture doesn't look as good today as it did uh, in 2013 or 14. Uh, so I worry about, and I think the net, re the, the good part of that vision was it includes not only our system, but other sister universities even outside our state that makes sense so that's 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 terrific um, but it does seem dependent on federal funding uh, to to actually get it off the ground and it doesn't seem to me that it's going to be a commercializable uh, in the near term uh, result uh, would you comment on that and then I have another question after that so we're looking at the military health system and the congressionally directed medical research programs as the two major lines that would fund this initiative. Not an NIH, not an NSF, but going directly under that. There is a lot of dual use in the defense, energy, and intelligence sectors that marries with this as well. The budgets exist within the DOD to do this. And if you look under the MHS line, the impact on TRICARE, the impact on the other military health system, things that they need right now, make this program a drop in the bucket. Secondly, there was a $2.5 billion investment from the VC community in quarter one that was released yesterday just for the Internet of Things. That doesn't even bring into account the other markets that this impacts. So there's going to be both a huge industry component. They're banking on it. They know that a recession's coming, and they know that they're going to have to be able to get through that. This is the next, this is the next big thing. That's a, that's a great answer, and I appreciate that. Uh, I know that you've included MRI uh, in this, and actually MRI is a great defense contractor, and, and so you, you've partnered with one of the, one of the uh, hidden gems uh, in the state. So I, I think uh, that satisfies me on that point. Uh, the other, 
is related, and I like your comment on it, but others as well. When we look to other universities and how they've been successful at commercializing it, so it's yours would be getting the funding uh, paid for whether whether or not we have a piece of the action or some equity. Um, but when you look at the other universities, I was shocked to find out, and this is the material that you sent, Bob, um, uh, that the top university was the University of Utah, and the number four was Brigham Young. And there's a little bit of explanation in there about why, why their translation to commercialization is so effective. Entrepreneurship is, is heavily emphasized, and Bob Shirley has studied this, they're in the translational aspect of, of the, I don't think they're as much in basic science as they are in taking um, the product. I think you had three or four steps, and, and this would be the last step where they take not the basic research, although I'm sure there's some, but that which could be commercialized, and then they use an expert committee, they look to outside experts, um, they have a very entrepreneurial center like we do on each campus, uh, and I think there's a different culture. Uh, you know, we have an RLDS community and there's a culture uh, within that, that whole community in terms of entrepreneurship that is hard to replicate, you know. Uh, uh, but I do think that those go hand in hand, and thank goodness that our system uh, on each campus has not just the seeds but well-developed entrepreneurship. And Bob, I'd like for you to comment about your thoughts. Did, you, did that stick out to you that, that the Utah campuses have, uh, have for, for several years, emerged as some of the best ways to commercialize or yeah. capture their research? They, they've been really aggressive in that area, and I don't think it's limited just to campus. I mean, that's a, you, you mentioned the word cultural, I believe. And I think as a state, uh, they, they are really um, very interested in innovation and entrepreneurship. So the culture of trying to uh, take innovation to commercial product is, is not just a campus phenomenon, it's the state phenomenon. Um, we have one of our four campuses, uh, MU is uh, certified by the APLU, this will be a long acronym, okay, and don't ask me to repeat what it means, but I was on a webinar with them on Wednesday of this week. They are certified as an IEP university through the APLU CICEP. So it's a standard which indicates quality in community engagement with regard to economic development. So that's a culture that we have to grow. And one of the reasons I was on that call was to talk about, do you certify systems for that? What's required if you're going to go down that path? And the answer to that is yes. We do certify systems, and the other thought was, when are you going to start talking with your other three campuses about becoming IEP certified institutions? So it is something we can do. It will require, I think, internally a cultural change. It will also require some resources. You know, we've talked a lot about great ideas, and what resources can we bring to bear to pull those off? What else can we do differently internally uh, to try to pull those off? Um, We've talked about uh, standards and can we get through IP more quickly. Another thing that I'd like Steve Graham and the IFC to look at the, during the coming year is our promotion and tenure standards. How do we value within our standards within the CRR our fourth mission? Frankly, there's very little in there right now. We focus on teaching, research, and service. I'm not saying it's inappropriate, but we have this fourth mission that we really don't talk about as our criteria for P&T. So how do we get to that type of position? How do we do more within the state of Missouri? It's gonna take a lot of cultural changes. And part of that, that's an overlying umbrella for meaning there's a lot of work underneath there that's gonna to have to go on. So I hope, hope that's close enough on target to answering. And doc, Dr. Harris, just to follow up. So you guys do have an office in Cortex. UMSL has an office in Cortex, correct? The, the Ameren Accelerator has space in Cortex, and that is branded as, a, as an UMSL operation. Okay. Now, because I just want to, it's, it's not, a, not necessarily a system operation, right? Because, you know, the whole point of this, and I, and I just think it's so important, is that we take a system approach to Cortex. Because even today when we did our presentations, 
UMSL's was non-STEM research. The other universities that do, Stan, I know you guys have some STEM programs, but our real strengths are at some of the other universities. So I think it's not necessarily, an UMS, it's important for UMSL to have a physical presence. My emphasis is system. And I just want to be able to get these other guys who really specialize in this stuff in front of the folks in St. Louis so, and Cortex well, let from me, a let system me clarify. approach. There, there are four partners associated with the, the accelerator uh, program. Okay. UMSL is one, AMR is one, Capital Innovators is one, and the UM system is the fourth. Okay. Partner. So the, the UM system is formally involved. Maybe I'm being a little bit partisan by uh, stressing the UMSL uh, well, label on the door, but we're very proud of the. So UMSL, UMSL is a central partner in all of this. It would not have happened without UMSL's leadership, but UM system is a part of that accelerator. Okay. But if we train the faculty, students, and staff who work there to say, to be able to share if there are entrepreneurs that want to come in to that accelerator, but they find out that they're interested in crop sciences or they're interested in, in uh, iVerify technology, that we train the staff to be able to link them to the other campuses. And that's an excellent, excellent point. As a system, we just have to do more of that. That's so critical. The same thing, if someone comes into the UMKC Kaufman activity, mm -hmm. we have to use that as a hub and spoke to the other system campuses. We have time for a couple more questions. Are there any additional questions? I'm, I'm curious about the S&T model of having a collaborative uh, that, that, that funds by membership uh, research and, and the, there did seem to be a little bit of negotiation about you could have different, different levels of membership and therefore different participations. Um, how effective is that compared to the model that we see more often, uh, which is you have a one-on-one -on -one collaboration with mm -hmm. somebody who wants project funding? It seems to be working pretty well for S&T because, uh, you know, per student, or the size of your of your uh, of your campus, uh, you've done pretty well in research, but it's it's a little different model than what we see on uh, on most campuses. Well, let me be brief, and then I want Maurice to answer. Could, I think you have the most consortia, if I'm not wrong, of any of the campuses. But the the purpose of a consortia like that, if you can create, is to principally do two things. One of which is focus on pre-competitive research that any partner in a consortia can share in. And that's probably the fairly standard model. And then as Marisa noted, there are other projects if a company gets uh, aware of expertise and they want to do something that's unrelated or that they're very interested in for their commercial future, then you can take that consortium and start to look at other things. But Marisa, what else would you add to that? Yeah, I mean, the whole idea is, is the consortia are is, is kind of an incubator in itself to do the pre-competitive research. And then if there is something that is identified, the whole idea is to get these much larger associate projects going on where there is specific IP that that company wants to retain. And so that's really where we want to drive them is, is to drive them the research out of the consortia, which is then shared by everybody and into these associate projects. Well, this, is, uh, this has been interesting but more importantly than being interesting it's been enlightening educational and it's it's going to help us as curators uh help work with dr Choi as he uh, and chancellor as they beef up uh, our research and thank you so much thank Bob, you very mark thank you and thank you thank you larry west marisa Moving on now to our, uh, back to our agenda. The uh, next item is the consent agenda. If you recall, uh, no one asked that that be altered. And uh, so there are still seven items on the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. Cindy, would you call the roll for approval of the consent agenda? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. All votes in favor. For the next uh, part of our program, 
it's actually a, uh, uh, a melancholy time. It's a time when uh, we say goodbye to three people we're going to recognize right now. But uh, we also say goodbye with a, uh, a healthy dose of appreciation and thanks. So at this time, I would ask that the Chancellor Sarita come forward. If you can uh, stand here, I would ask that the secretary to the board read a resolution that uh, will be adopted by the Board of Curators. Whereas Cheryl B. Schrader has served as the 21st Chancellor of Missouri University of Science and Technology in Rolla since 2012. And whereas she earned an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from Valparaiso University and a master's degree and PhD from the University of Notre Dame. And whereas her exceptional academic accomplishments and leadership skills as chancellor have benefited Missouri S&T in terms of a 16% increase in total enrollment, an 18% increase in ranked faculty, a 59% increase in US patents filed, and a 26% average increase in gifts. And whereas as Missouri S&T Chancellor, she led a comprehensive strategic planning effort involving thousands of stakeholders to develop rising to the challenge, Missouri S&T's strategy for success, which sets the university's bold course through 2020 and beyond by focusing on providing a top return on investment to S&T customers and has resulted in strong public-private partnerships. And whereas to enhance student education at S&T, Dr. Schrader made it a requirement for undergrad students to participate in a significant experiential learning program or project before graduating to help ensure that S&T remains highly ranked among its peers as a value-added public university. And whereas to keep research at the forefront of a Missouri S&T education, under Schrader's leadership, the university identified four signature areas, advanced manufacturing, advanced materials for sustainable infrastructure, enabling materials for extreme environments, and smart living. And whereas Chancellor Schrader is a strong advocate for innovation, following the Procter & Gamble model, she created an innovation team for the campus community to submit innovation proposals. The awardees received a seed grant to help with the creation or implementation of their proposal. And whereas she encouraged the development of online and blended courses during her tenure at Missouri S&T to improve student learning outcomes and student retention. Online courses offered per year increased by 37% and blended courses increased by 100%. And whereas Cheryl Schrader led the campus through a sustainable energy geothermal energy project, one of the most comprehensive initiatives in higher education, which has reduced energy usage by 60% and reduced the campus's deferred maintenance by $60 million. And whereas as one of the only a few female engineers to ascend the top leadership position of a college or university, in the United States, she has been a strong advocate for diversity and inclusion. The number of female students increased by 16% and the number of minority students by 38%. The number of female faculty at Missouri S&T has grown by 36% during her tenure. And whereas Chancellor Schrader received the Distinguished Educator Award from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Division of the American Society for Engineering Education in 2013 and was named an IEEE Fellow in recognition of her leadership and contributions in engineering education in 2014. And whereas Dr. Schrader will continue to be a strong advocate for STEM disciplines 
in higher education as she prepares to be president of Wright State University. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Curators, on behalf of students, faculty, staff, and alumni of the University of Missouri, and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Missouri, does hereby adopt this resolution in appreciation of the dedicated and devoted service of Cheryl B. Schrader. And be it further resolved that the Secretary of the Board cause this resolution to be spread upon the minutes of this meeting and a duly inscribed copy thereof be furnished to Cheryl B. Schrader. Mr. Chairman, I am very pleased to move the adoption of the resolution for a truly remarkable campus leader. I'd be honored to second that. Cindy, would you have a vote? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. And Curator Steelman? Yes. Okay. All votes in favor. Resolution adopted. And Cheryl, we have for you to take with you today a copy of the resolution, but you will receive a beautiful framed copy of the uh, resolution. Well, thank you. There are, are many things that I will miss about Missouri S&T and the <coughs> University of Missouri system. Um, and um, amazingly, it's the board meetings. <laughs> because there's always so much to learn about the tremendous things that are happening across the system and at the four campuses and the strength that each one of those campuses brings to the system. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I do want to first say thank you. Thank you for all of the many contributions that you have made to the University of Missouri system and to Missouri S&T. And I particularly would like to thank the curators and the general officers for um, you having touched my life in so many ways. The kind words that you shared with me just now begin to draw to a close the five years uh, that I have had here in my introduction to being a minor. The past month, as you can imagine, has been a whirlwind, but it also has provided some very important time for reflection. And most importantly, I am grateful for the friendships that began here and that I will continue to treasure for years to come. That we dug deeper over these five years is really an understatement. When we set out to chart our course in 2012, who expected us to reach the pinnacle that we have? Who thought that we would shatter goals set for 2020 over and over again? Who knew that our strategic plan would be so unifying that it would propel us forward in ways that we had never imagined? Who anticipated that we would establish such meaningful partnerships that we would continually bring value and great return to our partners' investments and that we would capture significant resources to achieve our vision. Now, as I think back on our planning in the early days, the great engagement and innovative thinking and uh, far-reaching strategy that came uh, from our numerous stakeholders was really the key. We did this together, and we've shaped our destiny in doing so. So the title of our strategic plan is Rising to the Challenge, Missouri s and Strategy for Success. And, but it really gives only a glimpse of the promise within it. These past five years, I think of our plan on a daily basis because it drives my um, behaviors, all our behaviors and our decisions and our investments as well. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret, and this is in line with what our president said just a little bit ago. Um, I don't think of our plan by that formal title. I think of it as the big bold. 
And actually, that was the title that I suggested for it. Um, but, but it was met with some apprehension uh, and I think a little bit of fear. And I can remember the com a comment that said, well, if you name it that way, what happens if it's not bold? And so I, I challenge you to recognize today that we created and we implemented and we accelerated the big bold. With this plan, we took a risk and we planted an innovative mindset that has served us well and has opened many doors of opportunity. Most of all, our plan has highlighted our most precious resource, people. The people within our campus community, our valued customers, and our tremendous partners. We stand here today a larger, stronger, and more diverse team than ever before. And our very diversity of thought is what has created an environment that fosters innovation. Such diversity can be recognized in many ways and at every level, students, faculty, staff, administration. And it is evident in a community that not only understands excellence in diversity, but celebrates our differences, gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, major, scholarship, among other areas. So I, for one, am eager to see what this university accomplishes by 2020, when it's 150 years old. And I'm going to watch very closely what it does in its second 150 years. I'm confident that it will continue to build upon the grand accomplishments of the past five years. The state of Missouri and our nation will benefit from these many contributions to economic vitality and quality of life. On a more personal note, my family and I have enjoyed our time in Rolla. Our daughter, Ella, many of you have seen grow and blossom. She arrived as a kindergartner, and she leaves as um, only a very proud mother can say, a fascinating and accomplished teenager. And she is ready for her grand adventure. My husband, Jeff, I know, has always been so honored to be with our impressive students and our outstanding alumni who have truly made a difference in this world. So we will each take our own special memories and friendships with us. And we count ourselves lucky to have had the opportunity to know you, to work alongside you, um, and to grow with you as well. The world is very small. We saw that earlier this morning. Um, and I think it's especially small within the University of Missouri system family. So I know that our paths will continue to cross, and so I, I will not say farewell. But I'm going to use the prerogative of being the chancellor of Missouri s and to give you an Irish blessing. St. Pat's, as you know, the pa patron saint of engineers, is very special here. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and the rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you so much. Dr. Hank Foley. Hank, could you come forward, please? Hank, we have a, appropriately prepared a resolution to recognize you for your tremendous service to the university in several roles, but most recently as chancellor of the Columbia campus. 
and i would now call upon the secretary of the board to read a resolution that will soon be adopted by the board of curators whereas henry c hank foley has served as interim chancellor of the university of missouri columbia since november 2015 and whereas though he took over during a difficult time in the history of the university he rose to the challenge with forthright leadership and class and quickly earned the respect of MU faculty, staff, students, alumni, and donors. And whereas prior to the chancellor appointment, Hank Foley was hired as University of Missouri System Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs, Research, and Economic Development in 2013, and later in a dual appointment as MU Senior Vice Chancellor in 2014. And whereas, as EVP for Academic Affairs, Dr. Foley led the system's strategic planning efforts, provided system-wide leadership in academic programs, promoted economic development and advanced research collaborations, and enhanced funding. He also led institutional research, student access and success, academic program review, and e-learning functions of the system. And whereas he is a tenured professor of chemistry at MU, and a professor of chemical and biochemical engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And whereas Hank Foley earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Providence College, his master's degree in chemistry from Purdue University, and his PhD from the Pennsylvania State University. And whereas he is an esteemed event inventor with 16 patents dating back to 1987. And whereas as part of his teaching and research experience, Chancellor Foley has mentored countless graduate and undergraduate students who have prospered in both industry and academia. And whereas under his leadership as interim chancellor, MU celebrated important milestones, including record philanthropic contributions, strong extramural research and creative works, prestigious faculty distinction, and increased student retention. And whereas Dr. Foley moved the campus toward open, open book management, meeting regularly with faculty, students, and staff to discuss university issues and to hear their concerns and ideas. And whereas he increased the number of admissions recruiters and supported the expansion of permanent recruiters in the Southeast and West Coast portions of the country. And whereas under his leadership, he encouraged researchers to apply for more grants during fiscal year 2017, grant applications increased 8%, and the monetary value of grant applications were up 38%. And whereas Hank Foley sought key hires to establish permanent leadership at MU, including the Director of Athletics, Vice Chancellor for Extension and Engagement, Vice Chancellor for Enrollment Management, and Vice Chancellor for Human Resources and has worked closely with the provost to secure several permanent dean positions. And whereas as he leaves the University of Missouri family, he will continue his career in higher education as president of the New York Institute of Technology. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Curators on behalf of the students, faculty, staff, and alumni of the University of Missouri, and on behalf of the citizens of the state of Missouri, does hereby adopt this resolution in appreciation of the dedicated and devoted service of Hank Foley. And be it further resolved that the Secretary of the Board cause this resolution to be spread upon the minutes of this meeting and a duly inscribed copy thereof be furnished to Hank C. Foley. The resolution has been read. Chairman of the Board, I'd like to make a motion to approve the resolution in honoring the tremendous works of Hank Foley and everything that he's given to this university. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to second that motion, but I'd like to make a couple of comments, if I could, before may. moving forward. I'd just like to say to everyone that, uh, you know, we had an unrest on campus in November of 2015, and one person was ready and willing to step forward and take over the position of interim chancellor, and that was Hank Foley. And I think during his time here, he has advanced uh, many, many programs I'm not going to name them all, we don't have time, but I would like to point out one thing, that alumni and donors all over the country 
were willing to listen to Hank Foley and they understood the message about Mizzou and what he was trying to do. And that year we raised over $170 million due to primarily Hank Foley. I think that's remarkable, stellar, and certainly he has been a real leader for the University of Missouri at Columbia. Uh, so Hank, I, in, in seconding the motion, um, we're gonna miss you, but we wish you well in your new position as president. Motion has been made and seconded. Cindy, could you call for a vote? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Motion has been made, seconded and carried. And Hank, uh, we have for you here this morning a copy of the resolution, but you'll be receiving a framed, signed copy of the resolution. But it goes with, as has been said, it goes with our appreciation, uh, as the resolution points out, you have served with uh, great leadership. You have served with great class. You are among the best in higher education. And uh, to you and to Karen, you go with our best wishes, but with our thanks. Well, this is <clears throat> an emotional moment for me. I have to be honest with you, I didn't quite anticipate that it would be as emotional as it is. Um, it's hard to go, I, I have to admit that. Uh, I'm deeply invested here, deeply invested in all of you. Uh, for a working class kid with too much education, this has been uh, quite a ride. And if you're old enough and you live long enough, after a while it sounds like you've actually had some significant impact, but it's really just age, you know, that, that we're talking about. Uh, the real test is not what I've done while I've been here, but the real test will be whether or not anything I've done will continue and will last after I leave here. I think it will. I think it will not because of me, but I think it will because of people like Mark, because of people like Bob, because of people like the ones we've hired, uh, Jim Sterk and others who are mentioned here. Uh, I think it will because of Kevin and the work that he's doing. And I think it will because of you, Moon, and the work that you will be doing. I'm very, very optimistic for you. I think you've come at an opportune time to the university and we're kind of throwing the baton to you now, if you will. Uh, I think you'll lead with integrity, intelligence, and, and bring real pride to the system and to, to all that you do. Um, Karen will miss it here very much. She's not at all sure that this is what she wants to do next. Uh, so if you see her in an apartment in Columbia, it won't be surprising to me. Uh, she really loves it here that much. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm looking for that last chapter in my own career. And uh, I have learned so much here that I'll bring with me as I go forward. And as Rhonda Gibbler likes to say, well, Hank, we think you'll do a good job out there because we've now knocked off all those rough edges you came to Missouri with. And I thought, yeah, you're probably right, Rhonda. Uh, thank you very much for that. But it, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, my heart will always be here. Uh, when I look at the gold and the golden blue tie at uh, NYIT, indeed, Marcy, I will think about the gold here and the golden black at Missouri. Thank you very much. You honor me. Exactly. This time I'd like to ask a very special person to come forward, Mike Middleton. Mike Middleton uh, was retired, doing some things with uh, Julie and enjoying grandchildren and 
doing all of those things that uh, people who are in retirement do. In November of 2015, the University of Missouri tapped Mike on the shoulder and said, Mike, we need you. So Mike came back as interim president of the University of Missouri and led this university through some, as has been mentioned, challenging times. He did so with great devotion, great skill, and went around the country telling the story of our university, but particularly the Columbia campus, which was receiving uh, bad press during the period of time. And he explained to people the good story of our system, the good story of that campus in Columbia. And he changed in thousands and thousands of minds the picture of our campus in Columbia. So, Mike, we have you here this morning to listen to a resolution that's going to be adopted that probably does not sufficiently express the thanks we have for all you did for your university. But I would call upon the Secretary of the Board, Cindy, to read this resolution. Whereas Michael A. Middleton came out of retirement and took office as interim president of the University of Missouri system on November 12th, 2015, and served through February 28th, 2017, bringing a calming demeanor and a forthright leadership during one of the most challenging times in the university's history. And whereas with encouragement from then board chair Donald Cups, who assured Michael that he was the perfect man for the job, President Middleton was given the charge by the Board of Curators to achieve three goals. To repair and rebuild trust with key stakeholders, to ensure continuity and progress during his presidency, and to launch campus and system efforts to make the UM system a national leader in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And whereas to rebuild trust and confidence in the UM system, he had countless engagements with all of the university's key internal and external stakeholders to explain the sensitivities that their beloved university was facing and assured them that the structure in place for the UM system remained strong and sound. And whereas to ensure continuity and progress during his presidency, he led the general officers to fulfill the task of the university's strategic plan including significant changes in the retiree benefits plan to make it sustainable into the future, an impressive increase in technologies licensed from the four campuses, and the largest single year of royalty revenue from the licensing revenue in the university's history. And whereas under Michael Middleton's leadership, two leading credit agencies affirmed their high grade credit ratings, AA plus and AA one with a stable outlook providing a third party validation on the continued strength and soundness of the university's financial stewardship. And whereas having had a campus perspective during much of his career, President Middleton shared his newfound realization of the depth and breadth of the UM system and advocated for the added value it provides to the campuses through its shared services and continuous efficiency and effectiveness measures each year. And whereas during his presidency, he helped celebrate the UM system's 30th anniversary of its partnership with the University of the Western Cape in South Africa, with celebrations held in both Cape Town, South Africa and Columbia, Missouri, he shared his fondness not only of the program, but also the passionate students that were to thank for the partnership. And whereas to make the UM system a national leader in diversity, equity and inclusion, President Middleton successfully launched a series of initiatives introduced by the board that included the appointment of the UM system's first ever Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer, the development of a task force to create both a short and long-term strategy, plan, and metrics to address diversity, equity, and inclusion system-wide and the execution of a system-wide audit to conduct a full review of all UM system policies as they relate to staff and student conduct. 
And whereas the true indicator that the UM system has become a model for higher education and how it addresses race relations is the countless invitations President Middleton continues to receive from national organizations to tell the story about the University of Missouri and how the initiatives put in place in such a short amount of time were the starting point for the community to come together, conduct difficult but necessary conversations, and create respectful campus environments for its students, faculty, and staff. And whereas, out of the goodness of his heart and a true love for his alma mater, he gave 15 more months to the university as interim president and served with sincerity, honor, dignity, and esteemed leadership, <clears throat> encouraging each of the university's constituents to create the finest university they can imagine. <clears throat> and whereas Dr. Julie Middleton, Michael's wife of more than 45 years, represented the University of Missouri system as an energetic, kind, and gracious First Lady. With her university extension background and phenomenal presentation skills honed from her many years as an educator, Julie welcomed the opportunity to engage in many speaking engagements where she carried a calming influence and educated her audiences on the value that the university brings to the state of Missouri. And whereas by complementing each other in strong partnership, Julie and Michael led effectively and taught the entire university community lessons in loyalty, compassion, grace, and leadership. Whereas following President Middleton's final report to the Board of Curators, Board Chair Maurice Graham thanked the Middletons for their service and unwavering commitment to the university and told President Middleton, <clears throat> you were not given an easy charge and stepped up as a leader when your university needed you most. You have led us through tough conversations and crucial decision points during your time in office, and you have made us proud. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the University of Missouri Board of Curators, on behalf of the entire university, its faculty, staff, alumni, friends, and supporters, does hereby acknowledge that many contributions of Michael and Julie Middleton to the greater university family and express our heartfelt gratitude for all they have done to move the University of Missouri system forward. And be it further resolved that the secretary of the board cause this resolution to be spread upon the minutes of this meeting and that a duly inscribed copy thereof be furnished to Michael A. Middleton. Resolution has been read. Knowing that Mike has lived a life that uh, few, us, few of us can appreciate, but that has brought him the wisdom, uh, the grace, the patience, um, and the calmness with which he discharged his duties as president, it gives me great pleasure to move adoption of the resolution expressing our appreciation for his services and that of Julie. I second that motion. And may I say a word, Mr. Chairman? You may. Mark, I just want to thank you for everything that you've done, um, especially with the civil rights movement back in the day. I would not be sitting here today if people, for, people like you wouldn't have fought for equal rights in this country, and I really appreciate that. You have reached a level of iconic status amongst young people. We um, talk about you. We brag about meeting you. We brag about having conversations with you. That's the impact that you've had on, on young folks, and I really appreciate all that you've done for this university, and I look forward to seeing you again, Mike, okay? All right. Thank you. We have the... Um Motion, we have the second, and would you call the roll? Curator Chapman? Yes. Curator Farmer? Yes. Curator Graham? Yes. Curator Lehman? Yes. Curator Phillips? Yes. Curator Snowden? Yes. Curator Steelman? Yes. All votes in favor. Mike, the resolution has been adopted. I'm gonna give you a copy to take back and to show to Julie, but you'll get a beautiful framed copy uh, shortly. As has been pointed out by John in the motion and Daryl in the second end of the motion, Mike, you were the right person at the right time. And uh, you stepped forward and you led this university with 
great class, style, commitment, and you led during a period of time in which the image of our university needed to be heightened, and you did that. You told the story of the university, the good story of the university, and that made a big difference, not just in Missouri, but around the, around the country. And so our appreciation goes to you, but it also goes to Julie, because you have a terrific <laughs> help partner, and she was in this with you all the way. So we thank you, and we wish both you and Julie the best in your renewed <laughs> retirement. Well, uh, like Hank, I uh, had no idea this uh, would be so emotional. Um, I've uh, been given farewell parties, uh, first from the Columbia campus where I served for 30 years, uh, and then more recently uh, when I left uh, the system back in, in uh, February. Uh, and I thought I was used to this but I guess I'm not. Um, the University of Missouri has been my home uh, now for uh, 31 years, not counting the seven years I spent here as a student. Um, the University of Missouri, Columbia, and its law school uh, really prepared me for all the success I've enjoyed in life. As Curator Chapman mentioned, I was uh, a very committed civil rights lawyer in, in Washington, D.C. for uh, 15 years. Uh, I often tell people that when I went to Washington, <coughs> I was hired at the Department of Justice in 1971, Civil Rights Division, in the uh, Honors Program, what they call the Honors Program. And uh, all of my colleagues there were from uh, Harvard Law, Yale Law, Stanford Law. And uh, initially I was very intimidated uh, by being in that kind of high grass. But I soon realized that Mizzou Law had prepared me to be as competitive as I needed to be to be very successful in, in that arena. In fact, I think I was a little bit better than most of them. <laughs> uh, there is something about uh, a Midwestern background that uh, gives you something that some people don't have. Um, so I really appreciate the University of Missouri for educating me, and I appreciate the University of Missouri for uh, asking me to come back as a law professor in 85. Uh, I left federal service and came into academia move from the D.C. area to little old Columbia and really found a home where I, uh, with the uh, remarkable uh, leadership of my wife, Julie, raised our three children and uh, we still call Columbia home and despite our retirement, uh, we intend to uh, call Columbia home uh, until we no longer have a home. Uh, Julie wanted to be here with us today, uh, but for the past week we have been doing what we promised we would do in retirement. That is, uh, we've been in Kansas City uh, keeping two of our grandchildren. And uh, when, you reach about, when you reach 70 uh, years of age, it is not easy to take care of a three-year-old and a one-year-old, <laughs> both boys. Uh, so I'm a bit exhausted. I, I, I left Kansas City at 6 this morning, and I, I made it here. Uh, the university educated uh, my daughter Kim, the mother of these two grandchildren, uh, M.U. Law. Uh, she had to go to a uh, management retreat of her law firm uh, being held in Puerto Vallarta. Her husband is a uh, scout for uh, the Minnesota Vikings. He had to be at the draft 
proceedings. And so we were delighted, uh, but had to go to Kansas City and keep kids. I've got two more sets of grandchildren, and I'm sure that we will be spending a lot of time with them as well. Uh, but Julie, no, I, I have always called Julie the personality, my personality. I'm, I'm sort of a dry, old law professor, uh, a, a, a serious introvert, uh, and she's exactly the opposite. And uh, I think the combination has enabled us to have some success uh, in this job. She loved being first lady. She wasn't excited about moving out of that position but she was happy to uh, get back to her volunteer work and to uh, being Mimi to the uh, kids. Uh, I don't know that I did anything really remarkable during my uh, 15 or so months as interim president. Uh, the university was in deep trouble. The university's uh, image had been tarnished and uh, Beyond the events in uh, November of 15, uh, there were other issues that were uh, frankly demoralizing uh, many, many people connected with the university, both on the Columbia campus uh, and at the system. And so I, I made the determination that the best way I could restore confidence in the university and uh, um, continue uh, movement on the strategic plan uh, was simply to support the very, very good people uh, that were running the university, the general officers, the chancellors, uh, the faculty and staff. Uh, our entire family needed, needed a, a boost. Uh, and maybe this will be a tip for future uh, leaders. Uh, understand that uh, the university is its people. And it doesn't work if the people are not included in the process and respected in the process and listened to in the process. Uh, and that is exactly what I try to do. Uh, it in involves a lot of meetings. It involves a lot of conversations. Uh, it invo involves a lot of uh, difficult conversations sometimes. But after those conversations, all you have to do is make a decision as the leader. And having listened to everyone and seriously considered their position, those decisions are generally supported. So I don't want to say it was easy. <laughs> It was time consuming, uh, but I think we got it done. And I truly mean we got it done. Uh, and I'm grateful to the curators, particularly Don Cups. I wish Don were here today uh, for, uh, I guess it was his idea, he presented it to me, for uh, seeing something in me that made him believe that I was capable of handling this job. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served uh, my alma mater, my university. Uh, and I, I really do thank you for this uh, proclamation and this opportunity. And I don't know that I have much more to say, uh, but you give a law professor the microphone, he'll talk for 45 <laughs> minutes. So, so I'll give it up now. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> The other thing, I, the other uh, goal that I had was to uh, get the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, aspects of what we were doing uh, on track. Not to say that the institution was not doing things in that area, but I have to commend uh, my first hire as uh, interim president, uh, uh, Kevin. Uh, he has done a remarkable job of uh, implementing uh, the, the plan and, and working with all four campuses. Uh, and I think that his leadership is going to uh, keep this university on track. And I know that Dr. Choi is committed to growing this university and making this university better than it has ever been. And I'm fully uh, 
confident in the leadership that we now have. So thank you again. Mike, as you can see, the the thanks of uh, the thanks of so many go with you. But uh, be sure to tell Julie. Be sure to tell Julie that uh, she was included in our thoughts today, and that we send her the best. Next item on, it seems almost anticlimactic to go to another, <laughs> to another thing on the agenda. But the next item on the agenda is, uh, are there, is there anything for the good and welfare of the board? Hearing nothing, uh, I am uh, honored to close this session, this public session of the board. And uh, I want to thank everyone who participated in making this meeting a success. Uh, so good afternoon, and we will go into executive session at this time.